Bill Bengston is a professor of sociology, and for over 45 years he's been researching an innovative healing technique that does not use normal means. The Bengston energy healing method has been shown to be effective on a wide variety of conditions, and it has proven its effectiveness in controlled studies conducted in biological and medical labs. Bill's books include The Energy Cure, Unraveling the Mystery of Hands-On Healing. Timestamps are in the description, and thank you in advance for watching. So Bill, to start us off, please tell me a little bit about your background and your earlier career before healing ever entered the picture. Yeah, that's a long time ago because healing has entered the picture many, many moons ago. Yeah. So it, it, it's interesting. I, I, I popped in and out of healing, actually. Uh, so uh, if you go back to university days, you know, I had no, not a thought. I couldn't spell healing. Um, I, I wouldn't know what you were talking about. I didn't know much about size stuff. I didn't know, I didn't know a lot. Mm. Um, um, and I was just going through life being a, you know, normal kind of a thing and getting through university and getting through life. And suddenly you get smacked on the, you, you, something comes at you, you know, you never saw it coming. And so I've been dragged into healing, dragged out of healing because sometimes you need a break. And then dragged into healing, and then dragged out of healing. So I, I don't, I don't script this stuff. It's just kind of a, it's an interesting movie to watch. <laughs> yeah. So how old were you when, when you first kind of came across it? Let's say. I mean, I don't know whether that was. Yeah. How old were you when you first came across it? The f first time I ever knew anything at all about healing, uh, and and by then I mean in a scientific sense, I, I can tell you how old I was. I was uh, twenty. Twenty. Okay. So you, uh, 20, and I, and I came across the uh, healing research of the great Bernard Grad at McGill University. Mm -hmm. um, were you at university and, yourself at that uh, time as well? Riveted. Say it again? Were, were you at university yourself at that time as well, or what were you doing? I was at university, life? and, and uh, I, I came across the, the great Grad, and he had done systematic studies with a Hungarian healer, Oscar Estebani, on mice, on plants, on wound healing, on this, on that, and the other thing, and I was riveted. Uh, because I, it, it, I have to tell you, it would never have occurred to me that you could do anything like a systematic controlled study, you know, on this crazy hocus pocus stuff. Mm. Uh, if I hadn't seen the work of the great grad, I, I consider him to be the granddaddy of all researchers in healing. You know, essentially the entire field of healing research flows out of his work in one way or another. Would you mind just kind of talking about him for five minutes, like maybe introducing people that are listening and watching that are totally unaware of who he was? Yeah, Bernard Grad, G-R-A-D, um, was an, an oncology researcher at McGill University. And so he was an animal lab guy and a plant lab guy and, a, you know, all, all this stuff. And so he was a researcher and he had been at McGill for a long time working in oncology. Um, and uh, he's for, he, he came across and was associated with some folks who would have uh, bad reputations now. Wilhelm Reich, for example. If you say Wilhelm Reich to a conventional-minded psychiatrist, psychologist like that, you're going to get a visceral response, oh, he was crazy. Now, they, the interesting thing is they won't know his stuff. Right. But they'll say he was crazy. And why? Well, he's been labeled as crazy. He was successfully labeled as crazy. Um, and, and he, in New York State, court ordered book burning of all his works. Now let that sink in. So he was just a so healer, he was he, as well? He, he, he didn't consider himself to be a healer, but though he did some healings. And what, it, what had happened is, uh, he wanted to take the, this strange stuff and, and make it conventional. Is there a way to conventionally study it using conventional methods and conventional lab work and all that? Mm. And he had access to all the facilities at McGill. Um, and he had among uh, uh, other things, and maybe his strongest quality was, he was tenacious. Mm. He was tenacious and he was not fearful. There are some folks working today who are fearful, you know, what if somebody doesn't like me? What if somebody doesn't like what, what I find and whatever? And Grad basically said, the data are the data. Yeah. You know, what, what am I doing wrong? He, he, and so in off hours at night on weekends, 
He'd go back to the lab, set set up set up some formal experiments with, can you can we alter plant growth through intention? Can we accelerate wound healing in in, in mice? Can we can we can we and all that stuff? And and so this wasn't this wasn't casual. This this was a guy with a fanatical tenacity to go after something and everybody be damned if you can't take what he's doing. Mm. And when did, again, the phenomena that we call healing, when did, when did it first grab you? When did it first really hook you in? When, when it got to the, um, uh, when it gets to the, the systematic stuff like grad, you know, and then I started to open up and see the world and it turns out there were specialized societies and it turns out, you know, and they, this was a world I didn't know. Mm. Uh, I had read some popular, you know, books that involved healing and had anecdotes and, and biographies and you know things like that of of healers, um, but that, you know it's just popular anecdote, and so it was interesting, but I didn't know what to do with it. Yeah. You know? And it was really grad who got me to go, you know, click, click, click. Something's going off there. Um, this is a viable field of study, and then again that opened up the doors to, to all over the place. And grad went and and and, and studied with Wilhelm Reich, he, and he said. He was the best microscopist he's ever met. He said, if Reich looks at something and it is, he'll see stuff that nobody else sees, and you go back, you see it. And in fact, these are discoveries that he's making. And and so Grad, who was an unabashed follower, not not in the sense of a believer, but a follower in the sense of pay attention to some of Reich's work. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. It's worth paying attention to. Now it's probably all outdated now. You know, and you're going back 1940s, 1950s. And, and so the stuff would look crude now, but it really was the beginning of systematic study of, of this. Wow. And Grad, Grad never said, Reich is true. He just said, you're going to get insights you can't get anyplace else. Mm. And his books were ordered, burned, and he died in jail. That's madness, isn't it? Oh. And that's all because he was interested in investigating these topics that mainstream science think are, well, think are nonsense. Yeah, we're, we're, we're great. And, and he was actually a, um, a right was a disciple of Freud's. Um, I, I wouldn't put that in the, that's a wonderful thing, Camp. <laughs> but um, he was a disciple of, of Freud's. Uh, and Wright came over to extend his studies on organ energy and all these other kinds of things. So, I mean, who knows how much of this is real and how much of this is not real and, you know, what we're calling today subtle energies or this or that. You know, the, the names keep being passed down over time. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's all the same plot. Yeah. You know, and, and so yeah, I, I've read a little bit of Reich, but I've never found a colleague in a professional setting traditionally trained who will not have a visceral response. Oh, right. He was crazy. Wow. You know? Oh yeah. Didn't they, didn't they have to, didn't, wasn't he thrown in jail for, you know, and, and, and they'll, they'll just know stuff that, that they know enough to hop on the bandwagon, get on the pile, <laughs> join the scrum mm. and, 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 and let's take this guy down. Yeah. But, you know, but without really knowing why. Else. Yeah. And grad would say, the guy was not the greatest personality ever. And I, I'm talking about Reich. So Reich was apparently, in, I didn't, I never met him, an egomaniacal, you know, this, that, or the other thing, uh, who could make enemies and really didn't care. <laughs> mm. um, and if you wanted to learn something, you hung around him to get what you could. But then, you know, you had to go bathe uh, because it was, uh, he was apparently pretty tough to put up with. Yeah. And, 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 you know, Grad would speak openly with me about Reich was, you know, he had certain character idiosyncrasies that made him hard to hard to you know hang out with. Yeah. What about your first direct experience with healing? Uh, the first direct experience with healing that I had uh, came about when I was uh, take this plus or minus a year or so, twenty two, um, and so I was about twenty two ish. Um, and I had met, I used to be a lifeguard and a competitive swimmer and all that stuff. Um, I had met, uh, somebody at a pool where I was lifeguarding who alleged to be psychic. Right. That's what I heard. So and how old were you at that point? Sorry. 
But when I when I met this guy, twenty one. Okay. And that I can tell you. Yeah. Twenty one, but probably my first healing was when I saw when I was probably twenty two. This guy, uh, uh, who was alleged, was a psychic and had just discovered he was psychic. And I went, you know, whatever. Uh, let's. It would be an interesting story. It might be a nice conversation, but, you know, I'm not going to sit there and hold my breath because someone claims they're psychic. And, and so I, I sat down with him, talked to him for a while, heard his story of how he spot. He was uh, pushing 50, uh, 50 years old. And. It's telling a story that he had eight months earlier found out he was psychic. So he did. This wasn't like a childhood, you yeah. know, kind, kind of thing. He wasn't born to do this, but he claimed, you know, wild success. And if you're going to claim wild success, I'm wildly skeptical. Yeah. And so I started to give him things to read and, and uh, that we, we would call psychometry. You know, so you'd hand someone a key, mm -hmm. you know, and they would hold the key and then get whatever they get, and you go hold someone a ring or a wallet or, you know, something like that. And I started to just fool around with him. I wasn't taking it particularly seriously, but dang, there was something about this guy that caught my attention. And I kept giving him stuff and he kept coming up with stuff that I, I didn't know about and I would go check and he'd be right. Yeah. I'd go, Drat. you know, what, what do I do with that? You know, what do I do with that? What do I do with that? And so I made the mistake of taking this guy, who the spontaneously evolved psychic, um, and I started because even then I was laboratory oriented. Um, I said, "Let's go to the labs. Let's go. Let's go find out who's who's studying this stuff, who's studying psychic stuff, and let's go down and, and test it under controlled conditions." This guy, spontaneous psychic, didn't want to do it, mm. uh, but I dragged him kicking and screaming. You know. Don't be a weenie. Let's go and we'll, we'll play. We'll hook you up to machines and we can, you know, go to labs and play around. And so I started to drag him from place to place. The American Society for Psychical Research, for example, in Manhattan. Yeah. Ma Maimonides Hospital in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. There were parapsychology labs going on there. So at Maimonides, you had Stan Krippner, yeah. you had Chuck Hockman, you had, you had a bunch of folks like that. At, at the ASPR, you had the greatest hits, including grad. Uh, but you had Carla Osis, who was in charge of that. And so I dragged this guy kicking and screaming, and I, and I made an appointment with Osis, and I made an appointment with Honiton, and I made an appointment with, you know, and, and to, to start doing tests. Um, and he was on the money. It was, it was startling how on the money this guy was. Um, and they, they, I don't know what, they couldn't see it. They couldn't see, they couldn't deal with the specificity this guy came up with when yeah. he would do a reading. It was not like it'll be light tomorrow, you know, and dark tomorrow night, and, and he, you know you were born at a year, early age. You, this guy was nailing specifics, um, and and he would go in. Here's a, here's a reading at Maimonides Hospital, for example. This is with Chuck Honiton in his lab. He said, let me give you something uh, I don't know that much about, and we'll see if you pick up anything. And he, he came out with a scarf, right? and he handed it to my friend, who I dragged kicking and screaming. And he picked up the scarf, and right away his eyes widened, and he got this look, and they start darting back and forth. And he gets up, and he starts pacing around the room, and he starts talking about animals. You know, like lions and tigers and bears, you know, it just didn't make any sense. And mm -hmm. terror and being stalked and being, and, and this idea. And, and he goes into some detail about what was going on. And at the end of this, Honiton says, Well, that, that, that was interesting because this is actually a scarf of a missing girl who we think was kidnapped or, you know, abducted in some way and then taken through the Bronx Zoo. Right. And I said, well, what do you make of this? He goes, well, I don't know. I don't know enough about what's in the scarf. And, you know, that was my only criteria. Yeah. Know what's in the thing that you're, you're testing. So we have some sense. But he goes, you know, it's, 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 it's somewhat suggestive, somewhat suggestive. And so I, I decided then that I had to take matters into my own hands. Uh, I, I had to go past what I was observing in the parapsychology labs. And I started to set up some pretty formal or semi-formal tests of psychometry. And what I did is I had, a, this is also 
since it's a long time, I'm sure the statute of limitations is over. I'm sure we committed a whole bunch of felonies during this, so I can, I can help myself now. Yeah. So we, a friend of mine working in a hospital in Queens um, had a bunch of people on the staff that he knew about, and, and I said, let's, let's see if we can arrange an airtight case where there's no viable counter hypothesis. Because my friend didn't believe in this hocus pocus stuff either. Yeah. And he said, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. So he got an admitting nurse. When you're signing into a hospital and you're signing your life away and you're signing, you're signing, signing. One of the things we asked was, can you sign a blank index card? And that would be put into an opaque envelope and that in turn would be put into another opaque envelope and we'd have an eight, eight, eight and a half by 11 or whatever the size is. Uh, 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 opaque envelope with a bunch of opaque envelopes in it and in there would be so we had no idea who signed what we didn't know if it was a male or a female didn't know their name didn't know anything and we were just handed and only eight people were dumb enough to, to write a blank index card so I took the eight I gave it to this guy and said why are they in the hospital so he went through the diagnosis he said they're getting this they have this pain they have that that and he's you know allegedly doing these, these things and then we would go here comes the felony part and then we would go and get into the medical records i didn't do it you know but people who were allowed medical records would does this match that yeah you know if, if you're saying you got this 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 i think it's probably diverticulitis is it diverticulitis or did you stub your toe you know it's it's it, that, that kind of thing so I was all excited because I thought I finally had him wrong. Uh, so I thought he only got seven out of eight. And I said, you're a loser. Um, but it turns out the hospital was wrong. Wow. So it was misdiagnosed in the hospital when the patient came back, readmitted, it matched what he said. Yeah. Wow. So it was, it, it was, that's what I mean by, can we make this more systematic? Yeah. Not, I'm getting a, something you know something like that so i still didn't answer your question which by now you've probably forgotten <laughs> no i think it was just yeah your first direct encounter with with healing but that was fascinating and i mean if, yeah, if, so if you want to carry comes, on there feel free <laughs> here comes the healing part yeah so i, I eventually get there it takes a while i'm you know, a little slow in the uptake no no i like it it's good <laughs> so I was hanging out with this guy because I started to seriously pay attention to him. Like, here I got on a silver platter, a guy who can deliver without excuses. Yeah. He didn't want to go to the SPR. He thought they were less than above board. He didn't want to go back to Maimonides. He didn't want to, he didn't want to, he didn't want to. He just said, leave me alone. You know, we'll, we'll, and, and, you know, maybe I'll do something if you design it. Yeah. Um, so we did, we did the hospital study. The interesting part of the hospital study was Honerton. I don't mean to pick on Chuck. It was Honerton. When he saw right in front, it was eight out of eight. He had to run statistics to see if that was meaningful. Eight out of eight. Now that's crazy. <laughs> Do you know what the p-value is on that? And I go, it's not the right question. You can't calculate a real p-value if the target pool is infinite and that you get eight out of eight of the target could be anything from yeah what's what does a p-value mean it's significant i mean the guy got eight out of eight lighten up you know they pay attention uh so anyway i was hanging out with this guy paying asking him all sorts of questions and he his readings turn into more and more physical readings. So I don't know, let's say you had a pain in your shoulder mm -hmm. and he would hold the, whatever he was holding. He, you didn't have to be in the room. In fact, he preferred you weren't. Um, and he would say, there's a pain in the shoulder. He often had a mirror image. So he, he, he stunk at left, right. Uh, but he'd talk about, you know, the pain in your shoulder. What started to happen spontaneously, this wasn't intended. It, these are only anecdotes. When the person with the hurt shoulder was getting read by my crazy friend, and he, the crazy friend was picking up the shoulder, 
The pain was leaving the person. And both he and I sat there having a discussion about, does this make any sense? I'm doing a reading, you know, and I'm, I'm doing a reading on your cup and you have some physical problem and your physical problem goes away because he's reading the cup. I mean, you know, you talk about a head wanting to explode. Yeah. When he put the cup down, would the pain rush back or was that, do you remember anything about that? Yeah, he, he could toggle, not toggle, but pretty close to it. It would turn on, it would turn off. Wow. It would turn on, it would turn off. But he, he didn't, you know, and, and so, for example, and it's a real reading. Someone was doing a reading that I watched um, at his place. They just handed him an envelope. Mm -hmm. You know, there was no markings on it whatsoever. And he picked it up. And he went, whoa, whoa, I got to sit down. Um, the person was in the middle of having a migraine headache. And he picked it up, but the, the, the interesting part was my migraine headache is gone. Yeah, really. And that's like, and he said to me, do you believe this? And I said, no. <laughs> and I said to him, do you believe this? And he said, not really. Yeah. Uh, but that was, I don't know if that was deliberate healing or what, but it was certainly a, a latent consequence of doing a reading. And so now I'm going to eventually answer your question. <laughs> All in your own time, Bill. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. I don't want to rush into it. Yeah. So, <laughs> so this is just a prelude. So I was in a kitchen with him having a discussion about things like migraine headaches, picking them up from a lady in Dallas and, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And, and, and so I started to get, I, I, I had to give up a swimming scholarship. Um, cause I had a bad back mm -hmm. and, and so I was a butterflyer and you don't want a bad back if you're a butterfly. <laughs> um, after a hundred meters, it just didn't work anymore. Yeah. So I was in chronic pain, you know, not flop on the floor pain, but, and certainly people had it worse than me, but I was in chronic pain for years. And so we'd come and go and this, that, and the other thing. And I, I, um, I was sitting there, actually sitting on a countertop, and, and he's telling me about his latest readings he did last night. And I'm sitting there trying to stretch out my back because of the pain in my back. And I thought, this guy's talking about relieving pain. I'm in pain. You know, I'm not the brightest bulb. <laughs> what might this follow? You know what I mean? What might it be? Think, think, think. And I said, I got to ask this guy to do a reading on me to get rid of my back pain. Here, come, here I'm, I'm finally getting there. And then this guy finally says, not finally, this guy says, ah, somebody's got a back problem. Really? I didn't give him anything. Somebody's got a back problem. And I, of course, didn't say anything because I'd rather watch him squirm. <laughs> so somebody's got a back problem. And I watched him walk around the room looking in his pockets like, Am I carrying something of somebody's that has a back problem? I don't know what's going on. So I let him suffer for a while because it's fun. And, and then I um, said, uh, don't worry about it. It's me. And he said, you? This is you? And I said, yeah. I got what kind of a blippity blip psychic are you? You didn't even know it's me. And I've known you now for a long time. You didn't even know I had a bad back. You're a loser. Uh, he, said, he said, keep your pain to yourself. I said, better idea. Fix it. Now I get to your question. And he said, how? And I said, I don't know. Put your hands on my back. And he said, then what? I said, I don't know. Take it from there. So I leaned on the kitchen table, scrunched over, said, put your hands on my back, put his hands on my back. And I felt something. And this is the first time he'd ever treated anyone. So this is my introduction to healing. Yeah. It happened to be me. Yeah. <laughs> And so he put his hands on. My back got close as I can come to it was like Novocaine. And it wore off from the outside in, I don't know how long, 15 minutes, making that up. And that was it. And just... he was gone. Wow. And he stood there, I stood there, and I just went, what the hell? And he said, what the hell? You think I did that? I said, I was in pain. I'm not in pain now. I, I will attest to that. Yeah. Uh, he goes, but, but, but what do we do? He go, sit on it for a bit. And that was my first uh, introduction to healing.
Wow. Yeah, that's wild. That's it. That's incredible. And I suppose it was it felt too strong of an effect to be a, a placebo effect <laughs> for it to be I you expecting. Care. Yeah. I don't care. I take a placebo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you're in pain, there's very few things that work better than placebos. Yeah. Yeah, so that's true. They work. Why not just take a placebo? You know, I'm fine with that. So did you, so, you considered that at the time? You considered that possibility, I suppose? Oh, of course. Of course. And I was always waiting for the pain to come back. Mm. It'll get here, it'll get here, it'll get here, it'll get here. Yeah. Just never got here. And, and, and so um, I, I, I was really left with a, this was, this was a life-changing moment. You know, spontaneous and all that. And at the time, you're just hanging out in someone's kitchen. It's not like a, but you look back and it was like a, so I, I had, at the end of that, I, I had kind of simple yes or no questions that I had to address. Is this worth going after? You know, what, what just happened to me? Mm -hmm. So door number one is I could pretend it didn't happen and be safe. Door number two is, could I figure out what, what just happened to me? Yeah. Because it didn't come from belief. It didn't come from anything that you'd associate with belief type things. But it happened. Mm. And so ignore it or go after it. And for better, for worse, <laughs> I took the path of going after it. So how long was it after he put his hands on your back until you decided or, or made your move in terms of going after it and, and yeah, picking it, picking it up? I wasn't sure what to do. Mm -hmm. And so now we're going back to the great grad yeah. because, you know, the, he would be my model of systematic scientific studies without viable counter hypotheses. If you have to ask, do you believe in, my answer is always going to be no. I'm not a believer. You know, I don't, yeah. I don't default to belief. I don't require belief. I don't expect anyone else to believe. Um, you know, which is perfectly fine. And, and I have no illusion that I have a lock on the truth. Yeah. So how long did it last before I, I, I gave up? I, I, I don't know. I mean, but soon after that, basically I started out by going to his place, grabbing him. You know, now we got magic hands. What happens if you put him here? What happens if you put him here? What happens if you put him here? What, what works? What doesn't work? You know, what, what, I didn't know what to look for. Yeah. You know, what do you do if your back just got fixed? I don't know what the next step is. Yeah. And so we're creating something new, you know, and, and so you're kind of muddying along and not, not sure. Is this the right step? Is this the next thing? Should we be playing inside a lab? Should we be do, trying clinical stuff? And the normal way to do systematic research, of course, is to start with lab work, and then you, then you, and then eventually you try some clinical trials and things, um, and and all that's you know fine. Uh, I started the, and I went the opposite direction because clinical case. Now, what happens if I put? And so I watched, I watched some pretty interesting things, and then I started to play around when he alleged that I could do it too. And I said, I, I, give me a break. I'm not a healer. Yeah. And so we start putting our hands and we, we put it on at least, at least several hundred people. And then started to get into it and modify and refine the question. So, for example, the hocus pocus, I like to make fun of this stuff. Yeah. Hocus pocus on my back was a one time only. A few minutes. I don't know what their actual number was, but a few minutes, hocus pocus, and, and it never came back. That's not typical. So healing happens, but it doesn't happen the way you intend it to happen. Mm -hmm. It's different from magical thinking. It's, it's different from thinking of instantaneous, you know, miraculous cure. Lighten up. You know, it, it's a natural. If I cut myself, what are the stages? I mean, that's the question. What comes next? And what do I need to do? And what does it have to do? And what are the parts that, that go together? What's the mechanism of action? I mean, it's the exact same questions you would ask of healing. 
but but since it's been intertwined too much with spiritual things mm-hmm. i mean is this spiritual if i cut my hand i don't know what's the boundary i think it's miraculous how does it work? And the, the, the simple answer is nobody really knows. You know what the stages are, but you don't know how it works. You want to drive a biologist crazy, and oftentimes it's a short drive. But if you want to drive a biologist crazy, ask him how. So you, you take the hand, scrape some skin cells off, and what happens? Well, the skin cells grow back until it replaces what was scratched off and then stops. How does it do that? And you'll see a biologist run out of the room screaming. Because <laughs> what you study is, if you scrape skin cells off, first this happens, then this happens, and as if there's a mapped out sequence. But who's in charge? And how do you know you've gotten the right number of cells to replace the ones you just scratched off? Mm. The answer is, you're safer if you don't think about this stuff. <laughs> yeah. How yeah. does healing happen? Well, is it... Is it analogous to I'm giving a treatment and we could talk about dose response and this and that and the other, but I'm giving a treatment. Does healing have to be reinforced? Does it start a process? It would, it would be like a rock that's at the top of a hill and, and you give it a, and then nature takes its course as it comes down. Or is it a flat plane and you gotta, here's another treatment here. You know, I gotta get that gooey stuff out of the way. Yeah. The answer is nobody knows. But it's intertwined with magical, spiritual, you know, people get all floppy on the floor and they close their eyes and they roll their eyes backwards and they, it's just healing. Just healing. It's just healing. Let's find out what's actually going on. But yeah. it's just healing. For crying out loud, it's been going on long enough by enough people. Let's, let's get away from the stupid questions like, you think there's such a thing as healing? No. <laughs> How should we refer to this kind of healing? Would you call it psychic healing, energy healing? What would somebody, you know, that's not particularly familiar with it, what's the, how would you suggest we, we, we refer to it? Uh, I would suggest that you don't refer to it by any names that are currently in use. Okay. I'm not, I'm not being facetious. Mm-hmm. It, it's the most common way that this stuff is described by practitioners, you know, card carrying healers, as well as patients, clients, as well as, as well as, as well as, is energy healing. Energy healing, yeah. Energy healing. I have a book called The Energy Cure. Yeah. Um, and I said to the publisher when they showed me the cover and the name, the title, I said, I, I don't like the title. <laughs> I don't think there's any energy. And they said, thanks for your input. <laughs> so, yeah. They didn't care past that point, but, but, uh, yeah, thanks for your input. But the, the easily the most common is used to be decades ago. Um, it was either spiritual healing uh, or it was psychic healing. Yeah. And Dan Benor, um, who just recently passed, uh, Dan Benor, a psychiatrist who compiled you know the early studies uh, and did a methodological critique of it. it was a good thing he did a nice job of that stuff. Um, looking at here's the designs, here are the flaws, here's how we need to make the research better, you know, all, all, all that stuff. He called it spiritual healing, mm-hmm. which I never liked. If you go back to Arnerton's time, it's psychic healing. I don't like that term either. But the reason I don't like energy healing is that I don't think there's any energy. So uh, it, it, it's good. Did you feel the energy? Did you feel, you know, you're looking as if I'm sticking my finger in a socket. Uh, did you feel it? Yeah, I did. Um, did you feel the energy? Are you supposed to? Are you better off if you feel something? Or is it better if you don't feel something? Mm. The answer is, of course, nobody knows. Yeah. What would you call it? What do you think we should call it? Informational healing. Informational healing. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think healing has any energy. I mean, I can demonstrate that pretty easy. If If I'm, if this crazy guy put his hands on my back, you know, and actually touched, uh, hands on healing, you know, so to speak. There, there was actual touch. Mm-hmm. If I'm instead of being in the same kitchen with him, I'm in Dallas 
which is the anecdote I told you of the, the headache. I'm in Dallas, and I pick up something of this person's, and they're in Dallas, and the and the how in heaven's name could that be energy? All energy, all energy, diminishes with distance. And it's pretty simple to calculate, you know, it's not, not a complex formula. Uh, but as I move away from you, it gets quieter. And it gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. Healing doesn't diminish with distance. Now, if that's energy, you got to tell me what its properties are. Yeah. Because by definition, that shouldn't work. <clears throat> and it is the case, whether you like it or not, because this isn't a vote, whether you like it or not, healing doesn't diminish with distance. And my follow-up questions would be, how does it hit the target? Yeah. You know, so lady in Dallas, and I'll say, lady's friend in Dallas. I'm making this up. Lady's friend in Dallas, they're three feet apart. The lady in Dallas doing a reading on it gets zapped and a, and a migraine is fixed. And there's no effect on this at all. Now, what reconcile that to energy? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't make any sense at all. How does it hit a target? So I, I put a, a, a cage of mice in San Francisco and treat them from here. Okay. Or I put a cage of mice and treat them right in front of me. Okay. It's the same question. But if you go into that and you let that wrap around your brain once more, the most likely consequence of any of this stuff is your, your head's going to explode. Yeah, pretty much. Because if you start listing the stuff that we know and try to hold it together, not by any textbook I have. Mm. I think they found similar things in, you know, the research with remote viewing and things like that. Is it, yeah. Would you say it probably works in a, because we don't know how that works either. Do you think it probably works in a similar unknown way to this? I think we're probably, this isn't going to be helpful. I think we're probably <laughs> thinking of the problem wrong. Right. So remote viewing, and then you, you get in distance, and then you got vectors of this, and then you got time sequences. And, and as, as you, you, you know, Remote viewing, it doesn't make any difference whether there's been a target even picked. Mm, yeah. The target's going to be picked in two months from now. That works the same. Now, what in heaven's name? <laughs> <laughs> Your head will explode. Yeah. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It just means you're going to soon have an exploding head. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, that's, that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> um, yeah. So tell me then, with the informational healing, now that we've got our terminology sorted, how did you go kind of from that point to starting to make it one of your main or your main area of, of focus, your main area of research focus? Um, and I guess on that same, in, the, in part of that same question, you can go wherever you want with this, but tell me about some of your earlier studies as well, the ones that kind yeah. of, after the ones you've already spoken about, when, when you got a little bit more in the lab and things like that, I suppose. Yeah, um, uh, I, I, I was hanging out uh, at Crazy Psychic's house, and we were, you know, people were being dragged in so that he could do uh, readings on them, he could do um, uh, treatments on them, he could do, and, and I, I, I was there sometimes participating, uh, and but mostly observing and trying to figure out, oh, what are the patterns here? You know, does this matter? Does that matter? Does the other thing matter? Does it matter what the condition is? You know, and, and, and all of that. And and um, no matter what what I did was, if I'm looking at clinical clinical cases, you can't solve a clinical case. Or at least I can't. You know, so I, I don't have my pea brain doesn't have the brain power to solve a clinical case. So, a uh, person in need comes in. Hocus pocus, person in need leaves, you know, and, and so I'm oversimplifying the model. Yeah. And whether they're fixed right there, or they, it starts a healing process. And, and it, uh, you know, I mean, those are things that are worth investigating. Um, but what did it? You know, so you, you come in on this date and you leave on that date. And between this date and that date, you used to be sick, you're no longer sick. You used to have this condition, it's it's not there anymore. What did it? Now you can say probability, what might have done it, but
But the reality is the clinical case is too complex to try to, unra- at least for me, to try to unravel. Um, because you have, I mean, think of the variables. Well, for openers, time. You come in on, on Monday, and then you come back next Monday, and you come back the Monday after. Well, that, that's a two-week span anyway. Things change in two weeks. Pain comes and goes in two weeks. Conditions get better and worse in two weeks. Yeah. If you got better, was it because, you see the skeptic. You, if, if you got better, was it time that did it? Was it pain is cyclical, and so you catch the person when they have the most pain, mm-hmm. The thing you'd predict is the pain would diminish, even if nothing real was going on, because yeah. it's following a downwardly sloping sine curve, you know. And and so you could make certain predictions. This will get better, and this will get worse, and this will. Uh, and was it what you ate? Was it what you didn't eat in the last two weeks? So you started eating grapefruit. You stopped eating grapefruit. You know, you you um, you took a multivitamin. You stopped taking multivitamins. How do you unravel that? Yeah. You may have, uh, and, and the clinical people are going to say, just be happy it happened. And my response is, I can't. You know, I just, I, I'm not constitutionally built that way to go, oh, well, you were in pain. Now you're not in pain. I'm done. Yeah. You know, it, it's, I, I just can't do it. What, what is the thing that turned on and off the pain? Well, I mean, I need to know that. So, exactly. It doesn't mean you're not happy it happened. Like, you know, well, yeah. you're happy it happened, but, it, but obviously you want to know. You need to know. Yeah, you can't just be like, oh, okay, you know, works in mysterious ways and, and leave it there. Yeah. So I, I, um, I was at this guy's house watching this relatively unscheduled, scripted circus going on of people coming in looking for treatments and readings and talking about this and their experience. And it was, I mean, it was fun, you know, so I'm not putting it down. It was fun. But after a while, you know, if you've, if you've watched your first hundredth healing, first hundred healings are really interesting. Second hundred healings are less interesting. Yeah. By the third hundred healings, I mean, it's like, make it stop. You know, <laughs> it's, uh, this is, I'm, it's not new. I'm not learning anything. Yeah. So the person would come in, they'd get better, they'd leave. I didn't learn anything other than a person came in, got better and left. So I was sitting there uh, one night and uh, I met this guy for the first time, um, named Dave Crinsley. And Dave uh, was a pretty well-known geologist uh, at City University of of New York, um, cover of nature and you know, all, all, all the biggies. Um, uh, cover of Science Magazine, I think six times, something like that. And so he was a traditional electron microscopist doing conventional geological work. He did a good chunk of the moon rocks, for example, you know, th- things along those lines. And and so I, 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 he was sitting quietly in the corner and I went over and we just started to talk. And it turns out we were exactly on the same page. He had brought a friend of his to be treated, and he was curious, and now he wanted to find out what else is going on there. But by the same token, what are we learning? Yeah. And so we started to talk and kind of tuned out the rest of the room. We started to talk and said, what we need here is something that doesn't have any viable counter hypotheses. Because you come in, you go, ow, ow, I go hocus pocus, and you leave, and who knows? Again, sine curve, time, diet, regression to the mean, you know, I can keep going. Um, and so he agreed and he said, Let, let's, let's see if we can work on that. Uh, so he went back, he, he used to be the acting provost and actually the acting president of City University. And so he had a bunch of people who owed him a favor. And one of the people who owed him a favor was the chair of the biology department. I don't know what the paper was, but he was chair of the biology department. And he said, this is what we're looking for. We're looking to do a healing study. And the guy thought he was crazy. Uh, And he said, but we need it without a possible counter hypothesis. If something happens, you can't come along and say, you know, make up some lame excuse. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I'm really time shortened here. A couple of months go by, we refine the question. And it turns out in a biology lab for 20 years at Queens, 
was a professor who had been working on a particular mammary cancer. It's a mammary cancer that's very, very widely understood and very widely known. Mm -hmm. uh, so anybody in oncology would know this. Bernie Grad knew that mouse, you know, that, that, that they're working on because he was in oncology and they're all over the place. And so if you give the geeky code to it, people, oh, I know that mouse. And I know that strain of cancer and I know, I know. He said, they, she's been working on it for 20 years. People have been working on this mouse model for more than 20 years. 100% of the mice die in 27 days after they're injected. 100%. Makes no difference what you do. Heat them, freeze them, feed them, starve them, give them water, take away, do this, do that, give them salt, take away salt. No one's ever made it past 27 days. No one's ever so even made mouse, one mouse live longer than that. Several thousand published studies. And so you got a normal curve looking distribution. It's, it's a beautiful model. It, the standard deviation of death is three days, meaning the tight middle of the curve, plus or minus three days. That's where two thirds of the mice die. And then you know the percent that will die as it attenuates out to more extreme scores. But no mouse makes it past day 27. And it's been studied ad nauseum. I like that because I'm a little simple in the head. I want to take a model that everybody thinks they understand and interject a single variable. Mm -hmm. So I'm not trying to tell me everything you've eaten in the last six months. You know, I'm not doing a case study and I, I, I want to know what's going to happen. Do you know what's going to happen? Do you know exactly what's going to happen? No, no, you know, and, and you go through and you go through and you go through and, and you do that. So we set this up. And Dave arranged to have this done over the objections of the biology department because he thought this was madness. Yeah. Probably was. <laughs> and so we took a cage of mice, put our hands around them, did our cycling stick, didn't know what to expect. I was thinking of healing at the time as similar to radiation. Mm -hmm. So you zap them. You know, you go for radiation and you go zzz, zzz, and, and there's a certain amount of this thing that you do and 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 then you, you get get a certain effect. And I was thinking if we got to soon early injected mice, like a day or two later, make sure they made it through the injection okay and all that. And we zap them and we get it before the cancer is even formed. And we're going, zzz, zzz, then it's going to, maybe we'll stop it. You know, maybe we got a shot. Let's see what happens. So what happened instead, and this you need to understand, I'm almost always wrong. Whenever, that, that's, the, that's the beauty of doing tests, because I'm almost always wrong. Yeah. I go, really? Who would have thought? I mean, I can't script this stuff. Um, so I thought we'd zap them early. Zzz, zzz, They'd never grow. Instead, the tumor started to grow. And I said, okay, it didn't work. You know, I'm an empiricist, it didn't work. Let's call it off. Tumors are coming, they're coming in as they should come in. And Dave Crinsley said, give it a couple more days. I said, why? Doesn't work. So you get, how much does belief matter? Mm. You know, doesn't work. Mice didn't believe, I didn't believe. So I'm putting my hands around a cage and the tumors are getting bigger. And every day the tumors are bigger. And I'm going, this doesn't work. Pay attention, you big dope. This doesn't work. We can go design another study. We can do whatever. But it's right in front of you. The tumors are coming anyway. Crinsley goes, a couple more days. The tumors grow to large size. And then they ulcerate. And they open up to a big wonkin exposed ulceration. And I'm freaking out now going, folks, it doesn't work. It does not work. I have evidence. You, you got this pie in the sky crap going on in your head. <laughs> this doesn't work. A couple more days. He said, look, look at the eyes. And the eyes were clear. Look at the coat. The coat's clear. Just had this big, ugly thing going on. Fast forward, this soon collapses. And the mice are cured. They're not remitted, they're cured. How many of them? 
All of them. At this point, are you talking about ever, ever, or at, 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 let's go with at that point first. Let's let's. Oh, let's, that point six. Six of the twenty-seven at that point. No, six six mice were treated, and all six had the collapsing tumor. Got you. Okay. Okay. No. Right. Sorry. Yeah. Um, wow. Now this goes to a couple of morals to the story. Certainly, healing doesn't rely on belief. Um, it also doesn't conform to what you want. Mm -hmm. You know, so if there's like a PK effect, you know, and my my magnificent willpower will will this into the you know the creation of the universe. Uh, good luck, because in yeah. healing, you're going to get some pretty nasty responses to that. Going, go stick it, buddy. We we do healing the way we do healing. So you don't like the way I replace the, my skin cells? Tough. That's the way you replace skin cells. You want to know how to get rid of cancer in in experimental animals? It's not what you think. It's not get to it early, you know, and that'll do it. It's not we'll prevent it from. It's not that. No, nope, it goes its own way. Yeah. And it goes the way it wants to go. And at best, you're an observer trying to figure out what in heaven's name is going on. So the tumors grew, and then. They Big. just and th and then they just kind of evaporate. They just kind of no. They collapsed. They collapsed. It's an implosion. And histology would show at all stages until it's actually gone. There are viable cancer cells, and now it's shrinking cancer. And we're not getting a remission. We're getting a cure. Yeah. Because it doesn't come back for the entire lifespan, and we can re-inject the mice with the same cancer. And it can't take. So the mice, really? are, they're immune to cancer for the rest of their lives. Wow. So, yeah, it doesn't just cure it. They, they'd be immune. Wow. And I'm not done with that either. You can yeah. take the, the cured mouse, take blood, put it into an infected mouse. It'll cure that mouse without the healing. Okay. So what we have here is the biological storage of healing information in a mouse, which is transferable. And you can see the possibilities here. Could we make a vaccine? Mm. Use this as a stimulant to stimulate whatever in heaven's name is being stimulated, but use it to make it a self-replicating vaccine. This is absolute speculation. My guess is we can. I don't think there'd be a chance in hell that anyone would allow us to use it, but I, my guess is that it might, it might just do something. But it's too preposterous to even you know consider and to even say it out loud. Yeah, yeah, what a load of rubbish. But hundred percent of the mice, and and then so that was six in the first study. So then I guess at this point, how many, uh, you know, what what are the numbers now when you look back? Three hundred. And still just, nobody's just, been able to to cure these mice by any other means. No. Uh. Um. I just finished some more ex mice experiments, including experiment 19 and 20 with mice on various types of strains of cancer at Tokyo University. So I'm doing research here, there, the other place, you know, all over the places, wherever the labs will let me set up shop. Um, no, and this is actually what got grad's attention. I published. First, I showed um, showed data around to some researchers that I had had met, and uh, since Grad was in oncology, he kind of freaked out because he had given this exact mice to every healer he ever met, mm. and and they never had an effect, including Esteban, the one who you know, worked in his lab for years. Um, so he he was to be kind. He was curious. Yeah. You know, what what in heaven's name did you do here? And he, he we had many long conversations in person and on the phone. Where he would grill me, you know, just how can this be? You know, yeah. I've been at this thing for decades, and you, you schmuck, you come along and, you know, you, you take this thing out. Yeah, it's like the only normal reaction, really, for anybody, and you know, unless you're totally convinced of this already, which you weren't, I wasn't. If anybody's totally convinced of this before hearing about it, the only natural reaction is, is what? You know, yeah, exactly. what, what, how, what, how, what, what on earth? And just, you know, just the words kind of hit a wall and it, yeah. how yeah. I, 
it's like you said earlier a few times like what do you do what do you do with this what are you supposed to what what do you do now like how do you because obviously it feels like it's something that could change humanity change the world but obviously there's a lot of red tape and bureaucracy to be yeah, able to do that one or, two, one or two people with uh uh spheres of influence uh that, that might not like it <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah um wow so so yeah that was i guess that was a moment where you felt things because you were already no you weren't convinced i guess at that point were you because you were starting to think two two or three days into that study you were thinking it doesn't work oh i was no i was convinced i would have bet i'm not a gambler but i would have bet whatever my upper limit would be that that it was failing yeah and the only reason that this went on you know frankly is because of crinsley uh because he is the person who paid for the first study. Yeah. Um, had the lab, you know, contacts, it was a big enough name that he could get other folks to bend to his will, mm-hmm. however crazy it may, it may have sounded. So what went through your mind and, and what was your, what were your thought process, processes once you realized I, I, the I, results? I, 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 I like this, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. you really don't. What, what do you do with this? What do you? What do you really? You know, it's the, total disbelief. Total yeah. disbelief. And what did you and, do next? Oh, I, oh! Right away, I knew the only thing that we had to do was replicate it. Yeah, more well. <laughs> because and replicate it without me. Yeah. So if I had gotten, you know, this guy had leaped onto me, and you know, now I was a carrier. <laughs> um, you know, we did. No idea, still don't, uh, how the stuff re- really works. Um, but he could, people completely naive to this do it. And if they couldn't, well, that's, that, that's worth knowing, you know, and it also means, you know, you're going to approach the problem in a very different way. So I, being a nasty blippity blip, I said to Crinsley, you're going to be a healer in this. And he goes, me? You know, I, I can't, I've never even had a psychic experience. You know, I, I, I you know, I, I'm not, a, I, I said, perfect. That's who I want. And then I got the chairman of the bio department at City University who thought this was complete madness. And he didn't know what to do with the results of when, when the mice were cured, why his biologists responded the way they did. So the lady who had worked for 20 years on these mouse, on these mice, essentially begged to know what the method was because she had never gotten a mouse to live today 28 in 20 years. Yeah, wow. Uh, so I, the first thing was replication. So I got two faculty members and I got two students. And I screened the students because I'm, I'm not good with uh, hanging out with believers. They, they scare me. Uh, so I, I'm much more comfortable with skeptics. Mm-hmm. So I went out and, and I started to talk to some you know, cherry pick students and I said, you know, here's here's what we were doing and stuff. And they're looking at me like, what? You know, what are you talking about? And, he said, and I said, well, there's healing. And what, what are you talking about? What's healing? You know, so th- that was the level of how naive they were. So I had two students who had never heard of the word healing. <laughs> I had two faculty members, one of whom was antagonistic to this, and one of whom was absolutely convinced he had no talent at all. And I said, perfect, I got four healers. So I trained them. And they each got a cage to work on, and they were all cured. Again, all of them, hundred percent. All, all of them. Wow. Now, what do you do with that? Yeah. So, I, I of course say we got to do it again. You know, something's wrong here, folks. <laughs> so we set up, we set yeah. up, you know, stronger and stronger safeguards. We, we you know, and. Um, I went to the chairman of the biology department at my home institution and said, here's what we did. And she just tried to everything she could think of to, and it just would lose it. She just absolutely go hysterical. She goes, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. You know, I said, perfect. She goes, no, it's really the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And who'd you work with? And I, I gave the name of the biology, but he said, you know, this guy. And I said, yeah, I know this guy. He was one of my uh, healers. And she goes, no. Okay, I'll tell you what. And this was her bargain with me. We'll do the experiment here. We'll set the thing up. We'll do it. This will now be the third time. But I get to handpick the students 
and I get to, I will, I'll personally make the, I'll prepare the mice. Mm -hmm. And he said, if I prepare the mice, no offense to whoever is working at City, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> These mice are dying. I said, let it rip, let it rip, perfect. She picked some students, short version, because this was a beautiful experiment, but short version, the mice were cured. She freaked out. I mean, she freaked out. Really? So she said, we have to do it again. <laughs> so we did it again the fourth time. And then even the fourth time doing it, and this is with a new crop of inexperienced healers, the fourth time the mice went to cure, even I was going, there might be something going on here. <laughs> Takes me a while. Yeah, wow. And so in all of them, it was 100%. There wasn't one that was, you know, was it 100%? It, it, it depends how you fudge it. Um, one way to fudge is, are the mice whole? Um, mice are, have an extremely high metabolic rate, and they have to have all their body parts working or they croak. Mm -hmm. So we, and, and since they're inbred mouse, they need, um, they need all their body parts, you know, and so some of the mice died within a couple of days after being injected. I didn't count them. And it turns out in autopsy, they had like one lung, you know, they had a bad heart valve. They had a, you know, and if you're, if you're a, a mouse on hyperdrive, you can't have one lung. It's not going to make it. Yeah. Yeah. So not, we didn't get a hundred percent. Um, yeah, it'd be hard to count. They, in, in, in one of the, did, did some experiments at Indiana University Med School. We had 100% there and then 100% there. We did three of them. And it depends on the model. So you, by now, after I've done it four times, even I can say, okay, this is, this is, something's going on here. The question is, what's the second order questions? What are the third order questions? Yeah. What do we need to solve? You know, and then, then, then I refused to do any similar experiment for the fifth time, because it's enough. You want to replicate it? I'll show you how to do it. Uh, but I'm moving on to other questions. And so it becomes then muddier because I tried dose response questions where they're getting very little uh, treatment. We tried what's the, the number of mice, the duration of the treatment. You know, we started going into the second and third order questions. And without uh, without going too deep into that, now, like how how did that kind of did did you see if did you see changes did you see these kind of things affect it like dosage and oh big long? time yeah there is I, I can speak with reasonable confidence understanding that I'm usually wrong but when I speak with reasonable confidence I'm talking about replicating it in two independent labs and getting essentially the same results so if that's the case and that's your criteria not I got a fluke you know. But this is, we know it's going to happen. Um, healing happens. You know, I mean, give me a break. You have to be a village idiot or you don't want to look at this stuff. Yeah. If you don't want to look at this stuff, beautiful. You know, I mean, if you want to put blinders on, beautiful. I don't blame you. It's quite a common thing, actually, isn't it? I was just looking at an article today, funnily enough, or, you know, I think a skeptic's website article. I can't remember the exact name or anything off the top of my head but they were kind of coming they were responding to an article in the psychological uh, american psychological association their their website that they published in i think 2018 making a case for psi phenomena and this skeptics website was coming back saying basically that we didn't even need to look at the data to say that it was no, totally either. invalid it was irrelevant you know because yeah. it can't happen pigs can't fly Start and so with the Start yeah. With the yeah. exactly what a load well, of nonsense this, this is inter interestingly enough exactly why i like skeptics your skeptic society aren't skeptics they're believers no. yeah 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 they're believers and it's really believers who make me nervous mm. So if you came in here with assurance, 100%, you're sure that you believe this, this, and the other, I'm nervous. You know, yeah. if you're if you're a, a, a mindless believer, almost redundant. If you're a mindless believer uh, and you know that it's it's all true or it's all false, you're the mindless believer anyway. I, I I've been invited to skeptic societies, uh, you know, the such and such skeptic societies to come in and do you know a song and dance on on some data. 
And you go, you walk into an auditorium and they're all sitting like this. You know, they're, they're like pretzels. Uh, they're sitting like that. And I, I usually start with my superpower, which is insulting people. Uh, and so I, I, I say, I'm probably the only skeptic in the room. And they go, no, no, we're the such and such skeptic society. Uh, and I go, you're not really misnamed because you already know that everything I haven't yet said is wrong. And it has to be wrong because it's going to be absurd. And the believers would know that it's right because wink, wink. Yes, I know. And I've, I've had, you know, the awakening and, you know, this. Well, give me a break. They both scare me. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. You've got to look at the evidence and, and see what it see what it says, right? Yeah. I've, I've given talks in, 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 in uh, departments of oncology to at least 75 practicing oncologists. And their goal is to come in and cut my knees out. And so I go and do a geeky kind of presentation on, you know, this mouse and that mouse and this strain and this protocol and this. And they, they, get, they went after me for three hours. At the end, I got a standing ovation, uh, which is normally what happens because then they go, well, we can't find a flaw. Yeah. The skeptic societies, where they're not really skeptics, it's interesting. You finish a talk and they'll wait and they'll look around to see is anybody watching? You know, because <laughs> you don't want, you don't want to, you don't want to get too near to get cooties from you or something like that. Um, and, and so they'll come up and they'll whisper in my ear, that was great. And I go, you don't have to hide. You know, I thank you, but do you got any crit, you have any good criticisms? Did I, did I screw up any, anyway? You know, and that was great. That was great. But you're not, there's the social prohibition of saying it out loud. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because I know the truth. I know the truth. They just don't match. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess it can be hard still for a lot of people. It's like, this is obviously this stuff is very much still in the shadows. It's still kind of taboo. There's still stigma attached, right? In the in the mainstream, as it were. Mm -hmm. But we got to fight. To, <laughs> we got to fight to just talk about evidence rather than rather than yeah mm -hmm. thinking about it too much. Like you keep saying, like hocus pocus. Like uh, it is what it is. I mean, it is. Yeah, yeah. it's okay. Yeah. Um, and when when I when I do a study and I'm wrong, that's good. That didn't mean I did a bad study. It means I was wrong. Did you did you do lots of studies that came out and didn't really you know it was unsuccessful always. and yeah. I mean, essentially, always I can't make sense because some of the stuff is is a little bit more detail oriented than I'm I'm doing here. But in some experiments, we had you know mice here and then mice there and then mice shielded though, from this and that and so you know so I've done a lot of second and third order kind of studies, um, and my and I always start you know testing myself. What's your best prediction? You know, just like if I had started before I was gathering data, what's your best prediction? If we get to the mice early enough, I think it'll be like radiation. Well, it wasn't. You know, maybe I can get it to go the way I want it to go. Well, good luck with that. You know, because it turns out it's not you bringing the existence into the into reality. You know, we're just not that important. We can observe. We can look yeah. and see what happens. What are the rules? What are the patterns? Yeah. The stuff is utterly fascinating. I could probably sit here and listen to you talk through every single one of the studies you've done in like 35 years. But I guess... Um, to ask you a question that, that brings us away from that a little bit, I would, I, can you kind of put into words what your method is? Again, I know it's like must be kind of hard to to explain. It's probably very nuanced, but yeah, would you be able to kind of talk me through the? Yeah, method? It's, it's 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 actually not quite as nuanced as you think. I can I can put the entire method on a single slide. Mm. Um, what happens when people see it is they they simply can't believe that could be something meaningful, <laughs> and so. The nuances and the, the complications come from people learning the method. Um, right. But let me let me just say here, yeah, it's going to be hard to explain, you know, in real quick, simple terms. But it's not secret. Mm -hmm. And so, if you, I don't know if you show websites and all that stuff, uh, but if at my website, there's ways to get the method. You can get it in paper form, meaning you know it's written out. You can get it as an audio CD. And, and follow like, like a learn and drill and practice of the thing. It was actually designed for that. Mm -hmm. You can get it as, as described and merged into some more geeky kind of articles. You can get it a lot of ways. So I don't have, you know, like a hidden drawer where I'm keeping this proprietary thing secret. <laughs> yeah. I'm inviting people all over the place, you know, by all means do it. 
Um, and, and so here, so far, I have to say, I've only got an anecdote in response. Uh, so a, a, as an anecdote, we, we got contacted by an anesthesiologist in Scotland who had just retired, picked up a hobby. The hobby was me and cycling <laughs> and, and said, I don't need him. Uh, I, I can go to the CDs and listen to them and then I'll just try stuff and I'll try it on plants and animals and all this. And she reports, she's a blast actually. She, she reports, yeah, so I learned it. It took a while. It's hard. I, I cursed you out. You probably heard you had your, your ears ringing and all this, but I, I think I got it down and I treated this animal, this animal, this animal, this animal, you know, with remarkable results. Um, skeptic in me goes, eh, we got to bring that into the lab. I don't have lab replication of a complete independent. Right. The closest I come, I do a lot of work at Brown University. Uh, I, the closest I've come to that is I'm considered a contaminant. Yeah. Just in case. So I am a methodologist, so I know how to design something and analyze it and do all those things. Um, but if, if we're setting up an experiment, I'm going to have my fingerprints all over the place so I know exactly what's going on, but I'm not allowed on campus. Mm -hmm. Now, I have no idea if that's meaningful or not, but that's the way we do it, trying to make it as pure as possible. Yeah. So the stuff that I'm about to explain or describe is available in CD format. You can take a workshop if you want. This isn't a sales technique. You can take a workshop if you want. Um, I think I got one coming up. I do maybe four a year. Mm -hmm. um, and they, the people that come in, they want to learn how to, how to do. Most of them want to learn how to heal. Some don't. They just are interested in this, the, the technique, which we call image cycling, uh, because it's, it's an interesting phenomenon. Stuff seems to happen in your life, which is coincidental. Oh, and really? stuff that, that you, you, we, we make lists of things you want and we make them very, very, very concrete. Yeah. So that you know what you have and you don't. You, I, the mouse was cured. The mouse wasn't cured. Right. You know, there's no, there's no ambivalence in the middle. You, you want a red Porsche. You got the Porsche. You didn't get the Porsche. Yeah. You can't have stupid stuff that people always want. So it works for things other than healing too then. And by the way, oh, I'll put all the links you mentioned in the description to your website and things like that yeah. so if anybody wants to go down. The cycling isn't a healing technique. Right. But it can be used for healing. And when healers cycle and heal, something happens. Something is, And I'm, I'm saying this as a skeptic. Some, something happens. Mm. Something really happens. So and I've, I've tested this. So we've done experiments with, actually these were on a mammary cancer also, but on a, on a mammary cancer with cycling, the normal way, mice get cured. We replicate it now, but there's no cycling. The mice die. Now that's worth paying attention to. Yeah. What does it mean? Not sure. What does it mean? And it led me down a different path. So I look at what happens when you cycle if you're hooked up to an EEG. I look at what happens if you cycle if you're hooked up to a functional MRI. And I can make statements about that. But it comes from something happens. The image cycling is the base for everything. For those people who don't want to heal, the image cycle because it has good benefits for you. So what, what exactly is the image cycling? Can you just um, for people like me that are a bit clueless. You're making, you're making a list of at least 20 things, recognizable, objective. You know, I got the Porsche, I don't get the Porsche. Um, I have it, I don't have it. You can't have, I want to be happy. You know, right. it has no content. Yeah. I want to be healthy, has no content. You know, if you can't walk, walking is, is, is concrete. But if I want to be healthy, I mean, it has no meaning. What would it mean and how would you recognize when you're were healthy? Yeah. You know what? A physician friend has described for me, not for me, but at a conference, has described a definition of a healthy person. And he says, <laughs> a healthy person is someone who has been insufficiently examined. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. <laughs> so what, what does it mean? You know, so I, I want health. I want, and, and the third thing that everybody wants is money. Yeah. It makes no difference the group you talk to. I want to be happy. I want to be healthy. I want money. Why? 
because money will make me happy. And I can, you know, and you go on and on. Can't use any of those because the images that you're going to make are images of things already accomplished without regard to when or how. There's no when or how in this at all. So I'm in a Porsche. How'd you get it? I don't know. When'd you get it? I don't know. Are you in it? Yep. So you have an image of driving a Porsche down the highway. I'm making stuff up. You have an image of driving a Porsche down the highway. You have an image of winning an award. You have an image of winning a tennis tournament. You have an image of now you either win or you don't. If you're a loser and you lost in the finals, then uh, you didn't get it. How'd you get it? I don't know. What made you get it? I don't know. But it's a list of 20 things. Now, 20 is not a magical number. It's a goal. The record's 94. It's a totally wow. selfish person. No happiness in hell. Just run it. And this, this guy went after it. And it may have nothing to do with healing. If it does, let's say I can't walk and I have an image of me walking, well, then I'm using it for healing. But it's not fundamentally a healing technique. It's a, I don't know what it is. People have called it manifestation. I don't like the word. Um, and you, you use it for healing or don't use it for healing. You know, I, but if you cycle, your healing will be different. I got a woman who was, Card carrying healer, sound therapist, this therapist, that therapist, Chinese medicine. She'd been certified, been healing for 25 years, couldn't, couldn't lick cancer. She learned how to heal and quickly did eight cancer patients in a row after 25 years of failure. Now, that means pay attention. It doesn't explain what it is. Mm. And if you say, oh, see, I got, I got, you got nothing other than an interesting phenomenon, which is worth pursuing. Yeah. So the cycling is list of 20 things, very specific. You spend quite a bit of time burning it. In, you know, I want, I want a mug and a stupid example, but I want a mug while well, I'm burning in, you know, the image of me holding a mug, drinking from a mug. I got, you know, the, I either have the mug or I don't have the mug and I got 20 or 20 ish images and we very 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 rapidly go through them do you write them down oh yeah yeah and we got guide sheets and put it down and, you know tricks to practicing this stuff and all that and, and and i think they're probably free on the website too uh but how do you make a list how do you practice a list how do you put this thing together um it takes a great deal of practice there there are workshops i'm told and and workshop leaders, healers, I don't know whatever, whatever they, they want to be called, who we can train you to do fix anything instantly in five minutes. Okay, good luck. You're better than me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can't. And I never know how it's going to turn out. So these rapid 20 images, you go drill and practice faster and faster and faster until it becomes second nature. I'm doing it right now. You haven't not seen me in a cycle because it's, I've done it quite a bit of time. So it's just running in the background it, because I mindlessly image cycle in the same way that you mindlessly drive a car or mindlessly walk down the street. Yeah. Now you started mindful, but if you don't transition to mindless, you're a loser because mindless is always superior to mindful. So would you rather walk mindfully or mindlessly? It's not close. You try to walk mindfully after you've mindfully done it, you're going to trip on your own feet and not, you know, you look like an idiot. Yeah. Goal in life is to be mindless. Yeah. Healing is the same. Cycling takes a while to practice, to practice, to practice, so that it can be received to the background and go on. And then here comes the hardest part. Image cycling kicks in when you experience an emotion. The stronger the emotion, the stronger the effect, we think. If it's a positive emotion, you're happy, cycle. If you're ticked off about this, that, or the other, beautiful, cycle. It's not a distraction technique. It's something that is 
instigated by this emotion, and it all reverts to extremely rapid in its cycle. That's it in a nutshell. It's harder to do than it sounds. So you focus on the images, the image cycling. At the same time, are you are you actively thinking like I'm trying to heal? Say I'm trying to heal your your leg. I'm I'm trying to heal Bill's leg. I'm focusing on your leg at the same time as my Porsche. Is that is that off base? Is it just off on the image? Base, off base. It it gives your conscious mind, your ego, too much credit. Your conscious mind. If I scratch the skin off my hand, I don't now focus on my hand. I just let nature take its course. It's not my problem. That's and an that's autonomic what? response to need. I think healing is the same. I think it's an autonomic response to need. And I think it has somehow to do with the information transfer. I just can't figure out how it's transferred. And I can't figure out what that information might mean. So mine is a speculative, vague thing that doesn't have much operational application. Yeah. Do you initially think when when you felt like when you say you're trying to heal somebody, do you initially at the beginning think about the thing you're trying to heal and then let it recede into the the subconscious, into the mindless state? You probably you probably can't not do it. Yeah. Uh, but if you if you're sitting here and you've got your hands around a cage of mice, you already have intent. Yeah. So I don't care about your intention because you're doing it. Yeah. Your attention I care about. I don't want your attention. That's that's conscious mind, pea brain kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, what would I if I'm sitting down with a cage of cancerous mice, and I'm not a believer? I don't know what to do. I mean, I'm I'm I'm, I'm as terrified as anybody else. I don't believe this crap. No matter how many times I've done, it just won't stop. So, yeah. what is my attention going to do? What good is my attention? It's the same question of asking, what good is my attention for walking? And the answer is it's not really good for anything once you've, once you've learned how to walk. And that learning how to walk will be done in a sudden phase transition. So Monday, mm -hmm. the little kid can't walk. Tuesday, the little kid will never remember how not to walk. Yeah. And then they can focus on wrecking the house in other ways. You know, they don't have to worry about how do I get over there because I just want to be over there. Yeah, I can just pull the thing down now. So say you're say you're in a room with somebody, um, and they 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 have a migraine or a headache or what have you, and and you 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 know they they say, oh, Bill, can you can you try and you know do your thing? How does it go from there? Is that a situation that you've ever found yourself in? And oh, and if sure. it is, like, so so how does that go? So you you do your image cycling. Are you at the same time putting hands on this person? Are you thinking? Are you thinking about healing them at the at the beginning? Like, okay, I'll give it a go, and then you think healing, and then you're going receding to just your image cycling automatically. Like, talk well, me I would I would keep receding there, and I wouldn't even include the image cycling. The image cycling is going to run in the background. It's just automatic, okay? Yeah. Well, with sufficient practice. Yeah, for you, for you, yeah. Yeah. So you, yeah, you 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 go drive a car, and you you everybody's had the experience of I missed the last half hour. Well, who was driving? You know, um, yeah. well, that's the kind of the state you want to be in when you're healing. Except time will pass more slowly because there's nothing more god awful boring than healing. Oh, it's god awful. So, what are you thinking of actively, or no, or is it nothing? Because because obviously the image cycling is in the background. So, right. what's in the foreground? Is it is it you're actively trying to kind of almost meditate, like be mindful, like just just think of nothing, or is it something specific? I mean, to, and this is going to sound facetious, but I'm sitting there thinking, so I've done lab work where I, I, I do, you know, five hours of cages, you know, at a sitting. And if you want to see time go slowly, because <laughs> the mice aren't particularly communicative, um, they're just in the cage. You're in, a, you're in a lab and there's a clock and it goes tick, tick. Yeah. And so if I'm thinking about anything, it's like, how in heaven's name did I end up in this position? What, what, what is this? Is this bad karma? You know, I mean, <laughs> how, did so I really... up, how, how did I end up putting my hands around cages of mice? You know, yeah. how, what was the, what was the path of descent? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's wild. Um, 
but so it's really not it's really not about yeah thinking something specific it's it's just yeah you so say it was me and i'm in the room with somebody say i'm with my partner and she's got a migraine and can you can you try and help me tablets yeah. didn't work whatever so i'm there what, what do i do i and it, I'm doing my image cycling and trying to do it in my background, but you know, and, and what yeah. do I put my hands on her head? Do I, do I then like try and focus on her? Do I focus on myself? Do I focus on nothing? Yeah, the, do I... the, the answer to all your questions is yes. <laughs> <laughs> because there's some people who put hands on some people who won't do hands on. Yeah. They, they only want it at a distance. They don't want to be in the same room or anything like that as the, <clears throat> as the body. Yeah. Um, so it's been done in so many different ways. We have a tendency to think I've got hands on healer on Healy and it's a short distance. So therefore, you know, and then you got energy healing and I zap them and, you know, we think in those terms and that's all beautiful for us to be comfortable thinking in zapping terms, but I have no idea whether that matters. I don't know. I, we we'll probably think about everything the wrong way. Mm. We don't really understand how this goes on. Yeah, I think that's the key at the end of the day, isn't it? I guess we don't really. Have so I have, uh, I've written a healing manual, which I'd be glad to share with anybody yeah. who wants it. Um, you, you've probably heard of these, you know, workshops and healing manuals and, you know, level one, level two, level, th I have no idea what that means. Level one, level two, level three, and level four. I, I, I trimmed it down a little bit. So my entire manual fits on a business card. Oh, wow. And cool. if, if, if you can see it, yeah, be playful. Be, pay, be playful and avoid ritual. You got those two things down, the rest is details. Don't worry about it. Okay. Because wow. playfulness seems to matter a whole lot. And in the case of healing, the, the question could be reduced to if the only thing between the mice and death is you. You can substitute people if you want. The only thing between the mice and death is you. How do you be playful? You got somebody that you care about and they're hurting. How do you be playful? That's really the dilemma. And therefore it takes up half the manual. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. the second half is. Avoid ritual. People don't like this, but all ritual, all ritual, you know, all ritual destroys the thing it's trying to produce. A ritual is an inversion of a natural process. So I come in, my, I come into a room, there's a bunch of people there, we're all having a good time, we're all happy, and we're going, yay, this is fun, I'm happy. Mm -hmm. Well, what comes first? The emotion, the feeling, the happiness. And then what came second? A spontaneous burst of handshaking. And you come in tomorrow and we're, that was fun yesterday. Want to do it again? Okay. Let's start. So now what's to coming first? The action. Trying to reproduce the emotion. It's an inversion of a natural process. First time you do, you create your, your ritual, Second time, third time, fourth time, fifth time, and after a while, it's like, oh, you got to do this again? What do we do? Yeah, we're the hand-waving people. Why? Because we're happy. And then someone comes along, you come along, and you, you have a manual. This is how fast you wave your hands. They have to be equal height. You know, you don't go this way, you don't go that way, you go this way. And you wave them at this rate, not this rate. This rate's too slow. And you have a you know, volume two, volume three. And you've reduced what was once a spontaneous emotional experience, translating into an action and with the delusion that the action will reproduce the experience. I, I, I put my hands over the client and I rub my hand in a counterclockwise way. And the, the client got cured. Write that down. Hand goes in counterclockwise way. How fast does it go? How many times a minute does it? Well, I got to write that down. And then I'm going to teach the next generation how to do this. Yeah, that's what's corrupted the whole thing. And after a while, it's just not fun anymore. Yeah, be playful. Do you know that makes me think a little bit of again? I I'm, I'm 
I'm not really an authority on it. I've never done it, but I've spoken to some people that have, and I'm thinking spoon bending, you know, like they, mm. I think I've heard people talk about, you've got to have, you know, the energy. I know you didn't really like the word energy in terms of energy healing, but energy in the room, that kind of, you know, like playful vibe yeah. as it were. Yeah. Um, so maybe there's some, I mean, I'm sure there is some kind of vague overlap or, or, or connection there. Who knows what it will be and, and when we'll find out more about it. Yeah. Do you, do you think everybody has the ability, you know, with, somewhere within them whether they can access it or not do you think everybody has the pure speculation yeah probably something you know there's probably a, a natural distribution as there is in most things you know so mm. can you yeah. drum you know well if you don't have any rhythm probably not uh and there'll be a, var a variety of rhythm people mm. uh so i i actually once wrote a, a, an article for explore um, and it was written with a biologist buddy of mine in the state of Washington. And he's a big healer kind of a guy. And we were talking one time and it, it, I said, it, it only occurred to me. I had published a paper way back in 2000 that said I had demonstrated it's teachable. I had demonstrated this. I, and, 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 you know, like 15 years later, it dawned on me, that doesn't make any sense. I have never demonstrated that healing is teachable. I've taken people. <laughs> Because I have no idea whether a believer could heal. I've never taken a believer, you know, whether they believe or, dis or disbelieve. Yeah. I've, I've taken skeptics. So I know skeptics can heal, but I don't know about believers. And I don't know if they could have done it before. So there's no pre-post test. Mm. So I give you a cage of mice and you, you do whatever it is you do. You stand on one foot, you spin around. And then we'd learn the cycling and here's the, you know, we, 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 there is no evidence to that effect anywhere in the world. It's just assumed. I took a piano lesson. I'm playing better today than I could yesterday. Well, that makes sense. I took a healing lesson. Did I play better? Or is there, you know, a graph and it, it, it gets better and then it gets worse and then it, and then it, and then it, we don't know. We don't know. So I had people actually screaming in my face saying, you're an idiot asking the question, can healing be taught? Of course it can be taught. I teach it. I said, I may be an idiot, you know, it's a separate question, uh, but it's not, uh, I, I don't know anybody who has the answer. I have the answer. Yeah, but you don't have any evidence. Yeah. So what about humans then? Like in terms of the, obviously the mice and cancer, you kind of had pretty good results in that, let's say, you know, 100% yeah. is not bad. So when it comes to humans, have you, how has it gone with that again possible possibilities limitations yeah we're trying, and... trying to figure out the, the the trends and we think we think there's probably something to um certainly the cycling matters in the case of humans we got clinical cases so it's more complicated you can't unravel it and we got all the things we talked about earlier mm -hmm. but we can't unravel it but with, still within those caveats, uh, looking for patterns, there are patterns there. I don't know that they're laws, but they're patterns. So, for example, we seem to be better at taking things away that you don't want than we are in stimulating things that you're missing. So if you are a Parkinson's patient, you're missing something. Your, your brain's not putting something out. And so there are consequences of that and this, that, and the other thing, but you're missing something. We've done uh, a number, not a systematic study, but we've done a number of studies, uh, uh, or we've treated a number of patients, and we're not very good at Parkinson's. Now, I don't know if it's because of what I'm alluding to, or it's just we stink at Parkinson's. Uh, we also don't have a type 1 diabetes cure. So in, in, in diabetes, type 1 anyway, you're, you're missing something. And whatever our intention is, or attention might be, or or or... We've never had that I'm aware of, of a real cure of a type one diabetic. On the other hand, if you have some, something you don't want, we got, we got a better shot at this. So if you have a benign gross, no good. We're, we're not good at benign gross at all. Malignant gross, we're good. So we're good with malignancies. We're not good with benign gross. But if you have stuff that you're trying to get rid of, you have a growth. We're pretty good at taking away the growth. Depends on the growth. Um, Alzheimer's. You got crap on the brain. 
I was just about to ask about yeah, mental health. Uh, we things. can get rid of the we can get rid of the crap. Yeah. So we don't have again. It's not a systematic experiment, but it's where I want to go next. So I've just finished five clinical studies, and now I've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, you know, in, in my studies. So I've come out of, of the of the mice route to peak. I'm still doing mice experiments, uh, but I, I, I'm doing some systematic studies on, on clinical cases, knowing that they're not going to be as definitive as the mice stuff is, you know, because yeah. it just can't be as controlled. Uh, but it's still it's 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 still reasonably interesting. So it, it's we we have plenty of anecdote of plenty of people who have plenty of things in particular that they don't want, and it goes away. That, I mean, I'll leave it as vague. Now th that that having been said, there's all sorts of other complications or things that make it more complex. How old the person is seems to matter. So if you are nine. As opposed to 90, the nine year old is going to heal faster than the 90 year old. Mm -hmm. All other things being equal, you know, famous, yeah. stuff, but all other things being equal. But there's still going to be exceptions. So we got 90 year olds who blam and they're fixed. It's like, you know, I, I can't hold this together. I'm giving you tendencies. How long you've had a condition seems to matter. Like the longer you've had it, the harder it is to heal. The harder it, or... it is. Yeah. The more aggressive the situation is, the easier it is. All right. So the energy in the system is coming from the condition. If you're just giving information, if something comes in like a freight train, it tends to leave like a freight train. If something comes limping in, it tends to limp out. Mm -hmm. So there are patterns like that that we can look at. And I'm just starting to unravel would be too strong a word. But we've been looking at ways I don't know if you want to go down this road. We've been looking at ways to make healing more conventional. And the way to make it conventional, if, if it's going to be made conventional, it has to have, you know, two, two things that you've conquered, so to speak. Healing itself, and, and think of it now as information. Could be energy. We know how to store energy. So you don't know anybody who doesn't know what a battery is. So you're taking something, you're taking an energetic signature of something and you're storing it in a little thing and then you're mass producing it. That means that electricity can be stored and it can be scaled. In which case, if we run into a battery, we don't fall to our knees and worship it. We go, oh, yeah, I got a battery. Now, even if you don't know how batteries work, it's the storage and scaling of a natural force. Mm -hmm. We do it in biology too. We have the storage and scaling of things allegedly related to health. So you buy a vitamin, uh, you buy fish oil, you buy, you buy, well, what is that? It's stored omega-3 fatty acids and it's scaled. It can be mass produced. Mm -hmm. In which case you don't fall to your knees because there's a fish oil. You go pick up a bottle of fish oil. Can we pick up a bottle of healing? It's the exact same question. First, we have to demonstrate it's storable, then we have to demonstrate it's scalable. I don't know if you want me to go down this road at all. Yeah, I mean, yeah, let's let's do it. Let's let's do it. I've got plenty of other things I want to ask you, but for now, let's do that. That's okay. a fascinating road. I can't refuse it. In 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 the I made you an offer you can't refuse. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> and I have the Marlon Brando voice. <laughs> uh, so so storage. I've done a lot of research on storage. Can healing be stored? And the answer is yes. You know, I mean, it's not even interesting anymore. And so a good chunk of this goes back to the great grad. He's the one who first started the experiments. And just about anything you can think of, he's the one who started it. Um, and he did some work on storage. And his method of storage was he did it with cotton and he did it with water. Now, the interesting thing about if we just mention cotton and water, so I have some water. This is inorganic. And by organic, I don't mean it has pesticides or doesn't have pesticides. I mean, there's no carbon atom. And so this is an inorganic material that turns out to be wonderful for the storage of healing intention. So to give you an example, this is a study at University of Connecticut Medical School. Took some water, 
ordinary tap water, treated it, cycled, half hour, making up a number, half hour, and they're fed to cancerous mice I never meet. They're cured. We look at the bond angle structure of water, it's changed. What that has to do with healing, I have no idea. Yeah. But here's physical evidence, here's chemical evidence, here's, here's, here. And this is now, something happens, water seems to be a really good battery. It's a good wow. storage medium. The second question will be, can we scale it? You know, so this may be a good storage mechanism, but if I have to spend a half hour in every glass of wine, wine, every glass of water, uh, I'm not going very far. Same thing is true with cotton, which I can hold up a napkin. We have fancier cotton than this, but we, we hold up a piece of cotton. Will cotton store? Yes. Will cotton scale cotton? We don't know how to do that yet. Yeah. So we've taken cotton, organic, cell medium, stuff you use to grow with cells in vitro, organic, taking a bunch of organic things, including mice themselves, and observed or inserted into them healing intention. The mice can now give it to another mouse. The cotton can give it to, well, here's an experiment at Brown. We've got treated cotton and cancer cells are brought. And as the cancer cells get towards treated cotton, they start to genomically change. Oh. Now, if the cotton hasn't been charged, nothing happens. You know, the cancer is cancer. What's the difference whether it's here or there? But cotton, which is charged, is recognizable by cancer cells. We're working on trying to make a gizmo that will recognize it. So I want the helometer or the chargeometer. So far, no, I got I got some buddies, electrical engineers and signal analysts and all this working on various aspects of the problem. Just had a lengthy one from somebody who's a has a PhD in signal analysis, and he goes, ah, I, I don't have it yet. I don't have it yet. You know, so I wrote back and said, Come on, loser, go back to work. Um, and 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 so storage scaled. Store we can do doesn't mean it's scalable. Can we make a scalable? And it turns out we can. So we've been looking into what can store without scaling water, but is there a way to make water scalable? And it turns out there is. So we built a gizmo, technical term, we built a gizmo that will take water that has been treated and you stick it in the middle of the gizmo and it does all sorts of weird stuff to the water. Nothing's plugged in, but it swirls it, it does this, it does this, it vortexes this, it vortexes that and out comes water. Now the water has never touched or been in contact, direct contact, but with the right materials and the right swirls and the right vortexes, it turns out that this water that comes out will do the stuff that we had in the middle of the gizmo. Even though it hasn't been actually charged by a person. Yeah. Wow. Now that's reasonably interesting. Yeah. So I started out and I did three clinical trials. They weren't experiments. They didn't have all the parts of an experiment. The three clinical trials, two in the States and one in Europe, of about 100 people each. And what we were looking for was a bunch of people with a bunch of problems that they'd like to take part in an eight-week experiment. So we put water that actually I had treated through a gizmo, and that comes a pipe. We can make a boatload of water. And we shipped it to, over the course of some months, you know, these 300 people, who then took two drops under the tongue. I'm trying to remember if it was four or six times a day. Either four or six times a day. And we had all sorts of metrics to measure stuff, like how's your general feeling? It's the self-reporting, you know, are you in pain? Is this, is this, is this better, is this worse? And they did they took it baseline in two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, and eight weeks. The results are startling. I mean, they're literally startling and, and, you know, it gets, gets me twitchy. Short version, 98% report improvements, significant improvement in something. Wow. The something could have been physical, 
the stu- something could have been psychological, the, stu- the something could be emotional, the, the subject could be and, and spiritual. And you get you get statements back to us, something like, I don't know how to describe this, but I'm better when I use it. I don't want to stop using it. I don't know. I can't put my, I didn't take a drop, you know, and magical things happen. But over the course of, and I do, you know, the geeky analysis of it, the results are astounding. I mean, they're really astounding. I mean, you know, and again, to a skeptical ear, this is, this is, this is crazy. So we yeah. tried another one and we, we just tried two. This is formally done. Um, and this is a real experiment, double blind, placebo controlled, randomized, you name it, the, 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 I've got it. You know, this is a nailed. Go ahead, give me a counter hypothesis, have a bowl. So here's the general idea. People coming into a hospital to be treated for COVID, they're coming into the hospital so things are not going well in their life. This isn't a casual thing. So they're coming into a hospital, they're getting treated for COVID medically. Randomization, yada, yada, yada. They've got 160 people. Half of them, roughly half of them, are going to get this water under the tongue. Half of them are going to get water under the tongue just from a tap. They don't know what they're getting. The physicians and the nurses giving them to the patients don't know. It's all been numerically coded, you know, the whole thing like that. So it's it's double blinded. Nobody has any idea what's going on other than everyone's taking sublingual drops and it's being administered by a health professional and they're keeping track and we're marking out. And then how's your cough? How's your this? How's your that? And we followed them over the course of a week. So the control group that didn't get the hocus pocus drops, the control group, the control isn't placebo. The control is medical intervention. So we're not saying take the drops or not. We're saying everybody's taking drops, but one group is getting, everybody's getting medical attention. One group is getting not only medical attention, but hocus pocus drops. Yeah. Is there value added? So that makes the bar much higher to beat because you're up against the medical stuff. And the, the short version is, I think it would be fair to say we probably have the strongest effect size on COVID that anybody's ever seen. Really? I mean, and by all means, go for a methodology. I can't give you the paper yet. It's just been accepted for peer review. We've been through a peer review process. It'll be coming out in about a month. But it's oh, wow. okay. it's it's reasonably interesting. Yeah. Um, and the 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 analysis. It, it's a good study. We did it a second time with co- people coming into a COVID hospital or a hospital for COVID. And that became more methodologically complicated, but essentially we got the same effects. So it's, again, it's replicable at a hospital. Yeah, it's incredible. Now, and that was only a few drops as well. Yeah, it's it's two drops under the tongue. You know, a certain number. And we in COVID, because we get rid of COVID so quick. COVID is not what you call a difficult problem to solve. Um, the the problem we have is people's reaction to when they take the drops and it goes away. Uh, the, 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 we, we, we gave, uh, COVID drops, for example, to someone who was in charge of a COVID ward in Arizona. And she, uh, doc in charge of COVID ward, she came down with it, you know, in spades and was, you know, in getting ready for a ventilator. We got her the drops special delivery. She took them. She woke up the next day and goes, well, the tests must have been wrong. <laughs> Cause you're fine. Yeah. Uh, we we followed in this study PCR because we have multiple PCR tests. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the PCR goes from positive to negative. But the interesting thing is the hocus pocus water that's come out of the gizmo seems to be, I got to be real conservative here, mm-hmm. doing at least what the original did. Doesn't make any sense to me at all. Again, my head explodes. Yeah. But something's going on, and I, I don't I don't pretend. But on, on other clinical cases, I, I mentioned Parkinson's before. We've never had a good case of Parkinson's doing it hands on, hocus pocus. We had reductions in, in 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 some symptoms, but it's short lived and nothing to get all excited about. Um, people taking the hocus pocus water. We got one guy, an astrophysicist, 
giving up his wheelchair that he's been in for five years, he's walking a mile at a time. Wow. I don't know what to do with that. No, I mean, I don't really know what to do with any of this stuff. Yeah, <laughs> it's exactly. wild, isn't it? it I mean, really when, is. when we're talking about the, the gizmo, right? Putting the, 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 the treated, the, the energized, whatever, charged water inside this gizmo and it produces water that then has seemingly the same effect. That basically tells us that the water, the hocus pocus juice, like, as you call mm-hmm. it, it, has been materially changed, right? Mm-hmm. By by this process of charging, again, this this kind of hard, this nuanced process of, of affecting this water. Mm-hmm. It, it's materially changing it in a way that's then perceivable by this, this machine and then replicable by this machine. And then somehow it still carries the same effect. So it's not magic. But at the same time, it is kind of magic. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's, it's it, is. Wild. it is. It's nutty. You know, again, yeah. if you had come to me not too long ago and said, here's where you're going to end up, you know, as 2023 uh, comes, through, I'd say, you're out of your blippity blip mind. <laughs> you know, I mean, this whole ride from the first kitchen, put your hands on my back and fix it, not scripted by me. <laughs> yeah. And I never know what's going to come tomorrow. Absolute whirlwind, yeah. I so we've been playing with different ways to store and scale, including recordings. So if you think of, can we store healing intention in a recording or can we record it in some way, um, that's maximally scalable. Because mm-hmm. if I have a recording that works, I can upload Like of your voice. Cloud. Like a voice recording, an audio recording, or no, no, but of... if I, any any old type. So I, I have a, a, a pretty good study that I did with a number of other folks. If you're in parapsychology, one of the guys on my team is Dean Raiden. You, yeah, you know, Dean. yeah, I spoke to Dean a few weeks ago. In fact, Dean was the the person that recommended I yeah. reach out to you in the first place. Yeah, he he um, probably was trying to kill you by say go talk to Bankston. <laughs> 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 Dean's great. Dean's great. Yeah, 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 he is. Um, so Dean, Dean's on the team. I got a biologist on the team, a signal an analyst on the team. I got, you know, I got a guy. So I put together teams of folks. And then what we did is we went into a big walk in Faraday cage and three people producing, uh, three people who knows this technique would take a piece of cotton and charge it in the middle of the Faraday cage as we ran 33 different detectors. And we got 33 different detectors because we have no idea what we're doing. So we just yeah. got to throw, you know, throw it at the wall and see what sticks. So we had these kind of detectors, those kinds. We had scalar field detectors. We had, and this was all run through a actually a custom supercomputer because it's a big database, and we have a recording that you can't hear. We took that, we went to Brown, played this recording to cancer cells, and we looked at 167 genes. 68 of them reliably change when we turn this recording on. And they have to do with immune system stimulation. They have to do with telomere length extension. They have to do with a bunch of things that you might think should matter. Cancer cells in an incubator can tell that this has been intentionally transmitted. Now, that's the good news. But one among the, the findings of that, and we published this in a, in a traditional biology journal, um, we, one of the things that this is really implying is there's a technology possible. Mm. Now, we did comparisons. If you take, uh, you do the cycling and you put your hands around some cancer cells, Let's time it. We'll do a time sequence. This is what happens after this length of time and this, this, and this, and this is the number of protein folds and changes in your gene stuff and, and, and all of that. If, can we do it side by side and look at hands on or near hands on and the recording? Is there, a, is there, uh, is one stronger than the other? And it turns out right now, yes, the hands on is stronger than the recording. And I can't say that about the water. Mm. So although the water goes through a gizmo, comes out the other side and it's clearly scalable, 
It's not as scalable as a recording. Yeah. But there's been something captured in this water that might be as good as anything else that we've ever done. In which case, how do we mass produce water? Well, get a bunch of gizmos or, or, or you know, it's going to be interesting. So in about a month when I come out with a paper uh, that says, here, here are the results, you know, go ahead, find a flaw. Um, in, in COVID anyway, I think a reasonable question will be, what's next? Yeah. You know, because you can look at this a, a number of ways. One. A technology of healing is possible. Well, that's that's reasonably interesting, whether it's about COVID or not. And if it, if a technology is possible, that means we can put it out on the table. We can all work on it. So maybe what we have now isn't this the recording anyway? Isn't as good as hands on? Um, but we're we're driving a Model T. It can be changed. It can be made better. So we're looking at ways to make it better. And I've got double axes of how scalable is the material. How powerful is the material? And so far, the winner is scalable as well as as, as good as the original uh, stored water. Stored cotton is wonderful, but it doesn't scale. Hmm. At least we don't know how to do it. Yeah. So wow. we're working on the, the two have to come together to a point that this is maximally scalable, maximally storable. Hmm. Have you ever had any contact with government or big pharma or anything like that? Have they ever reached out to you? Say, hey, stop what you do. <laughs> many, 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 many years ago, I was, look I was looking for some funding um, and approached a couple of pharmaceuticals. I approached them. Uh, yeah. one, one was a Japanese firm and one was an American firm. And they were doing cancer research, you know, of, of and, and so I sent them my data. Yeah. And they both were like, whoa, what, what, you, what? <laughs> you know, so they, they recognized, of course, what was going on. They didn't recognize the cure because they'd never seen it. And I said, what I'm looking to do is try to make a vaccine out of this. You guys make vaccines. I can't. Um, you know, that's, that's past normal labs. Um, so you're really down to a pharmaceutical if you're going to create something of pharmaceutical grade. Uh, so the, both of them gave me um, non-disclosure agreements, you know, to sign. And I, I gave them to, I'm not that naive, so I gave them to a lawyer friend of somebody I had treated uh, for something. And he gave it to a partner of his in Manhattan who worked with pharmaceuticals. He said, don't sign this. What, what you're really signing is they own you in the entirety and they can use or stop you from using anything that you've ever done. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, he, I said, what, what can I do? And he said, well, I'll have my partner draw up a real agreement. You know, so it came back and witnessed it. And therefore, and hitherto, they wouldn't sign it. Yeah. Nothing else. Never anything else. No, not in terms of a pharmacy. I've had yeah. biology labs. You know, I mean, that, you know, I've got labs stunned people in various parts of the country. <laughs> yeah. You know, that, that are willing to work and willing to this and willing to that. Uh, but not in terms of what do you do next? So if I hold up yeah. a paper and go, if you don't want COVID, here's how you get rid of it. But it's not about COVID. It's about, it's a good test because it has subjective elements. How do you feel? How much do you cough? It has objective elements. What's your PCR showing? You know, and we can nail it subjectively and objectively. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see if anybody wants it. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot. I think a lot of people might give it a go. Um, so I've taken up quite a lot of your time. Maybe let's try and sail through some of my questions now. Try and kind of almost a semi quick fire thing. I feel like I could sit here and talk to you for hours upon hours, um, but in the interests of not keeping you here all day, yeah, let's try and sail through a few of these if we can. So just again, just in a nutshell, have you ever thought of or have you actually tried any of these methods with, um, say, something like depression? Something yes. that's it works yeah. wildly on depression. Same with the water. We have people who have been in deep depression for years. Uh, they're off their meds. We got bipolar people who are off their meds um, because the, you know people who just got out of hospitals 
for bipolar yeah. and you know it, it affects it affects us so so yeah short version yep short version yeah okay cool um and if this again we don't know exactly how it works we've established that you don't like to think of it as intent or belief or expectation or anything along those lines but if we're able to improve the health of somebody based on again i don't know the right word but based on our let's just say our thoughts even though that might not be what it is would there then be the potential for hurting somebody you know do you get what i'm saying for if we're able to help somebody's health is there also the same potential to harm somebody's health like is that a kind of dangerous side element of this whole thing i i, I think it, it's a dangerous side element but i've never tried a systematic study of can no. i hurt something my no. guess is we could uh my strong recommendation would be you shouldn't yeah um and the, the reason not just ethical but the reason is when you give a treatment, and this I can't really back up, when, when you give a treatment, I think you get a treatment. And a desire to hurt, you know, we're calling that the intention part, mm. probably would do something that, that wouldn't be a great thing to do. I mean, yeah. I, 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 so I, I can't really answer your question, but I would say you shouldn't. Uh, yeah. and, it, and just for selfish reasons, you shouldn't do it. And let yeah, me, let me rephrase the, the question just to screw with your head a little bit. And when you're healing, you're killing things. Yeah, I see. I get you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. That's so I interesting have the way. thing that I don't want. How do I get rid of it? Yeah. You don't have yeah. good intentions towards the thing you don't want. No, no, absolutely not. And But we call that positive thinking. Well, that's not positive thinking. That's negative thinking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. Interesting. Um, but like you say, don't. Nobody try that at home, the negative side of it. Um, okay. Um, are you aware of any other similar or not similar methods of, of healing that have shown themselves to be successful? Or is yours seeming like one of the, the only ones that has done that? I, I don't know any another system where the people have been as relentless. Mm-hmm and put together teams like I put together, I don't know of an equivalent. And that's not yeah. meant to be boastful. I just don't know of an equivalent. No, no, fair enough. Whether, um, whether other healing things, <clears throat> I have a list of hundreds of questions that we know nothing about. One of the things, among the things we don't know anything about is what, how much of the different healing techniques produce different results. So I don't know comparative healing stuff. I'm not a healer. Um, doesn't mean I can't heal. It just means I'm not a healer. I don't think of myself that way in, 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 in any way. Um, but, you, you know, the, I, I've, I've listened to the anecdotes of folks who have studied healing and they, they do this, they do that, they do the other. And they talk mm -hmm. about differences. I don't know what to make of what they're saying because I have no experiential reference. I don't yeah. know of anything like you've taken my stuff and tried to replicate it with Reiki. Uh, actually, I do know some stuff like that. Yeah, it, it, you, know, you replicate it with therapeutic touch. You get effects, but my effect sizes seem to be big. Yeah. What about, have you ever come across, I mean, I don't know if you've ever had a lucid dream, but I spoke to somebody called Robert Wagner, who's a you know a, a kind of expert in lucid dreaming. He's, uh, he's had thousands and he's written a couple of books on it and things like that. And he talked to me at this point when I had this conversation with him, I was totally unprepared to, uh, to hear any of the stuff and I was not expecting him to tell me about this stuff. But he started talking about the fact that we can heal ourselves within a lucid dream, both kind of yeah. emotionally, spiritually, mentally, but also physically, um, which really kind of threw me off at the time. Have you come across this kind of thing? And, and what are your thoughts on that? I've heard it, but I don't, I don't know it. You know, I don't, I don't have any, I, I hear the anecdotal experiences of other people doing this and that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there's anything sacred about what I do. You know, it's a gimmick. Yeah. Yeah. And so your question is really reverting to do different gimmicks produce different results? Um, or just do you think there's anything to it? I guess I'm just asking for your two cents, really. Just And I know it's kind of speculation because you haven't done the science on these yeah, things, yeah. but yeah, I, just I, your gut feeling on it. My gut feeling is probably there's a, there's, there's a, a bunch of different ways to skin the cat, so to speak. Mm -hmm. A bunch of different ways to get to the same end point. So you uh, think it, it would also... It, it, is, it is suggestive, though, that when you take out the cycling part, 
no, no, I'm not, certainly not suggesting cycling is sacred, but I'm saying when we take it out, something drastic happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know, you know, I think that stuff is worth pursuing. Uh, yeah. uh, the, the people who've studied healing of different schools or types or styles, you know, they, they, they don't agree about what. So, so you get like people talking about Reiki symbols. And I'm talking to a Reiki master who, oh, yeah, they, they're meaningful, they're central to this. And the other master says, no, they don't matter at all. You know, I don't, I don't know what to do with that. Mm. And I, my, my thing would be, has anybody tested this stuff? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What about in terms of, again, I know we're a little bit speculation here and again, just looking for your gut feeling, but in terms of near-death experiences, I'm sure you've come across people that have had near-death experiences that then when they come back to their body, it seems like they're just miraculously healed from whatever it might be, a cancer or something else yeah. um, following the experience. Again, do you, have any, do you have any thoughts on it? Do you have a take on it? Do you think it's something that happens? Again, it's going to be obviously way harder to put in a lab than your stuff and way harder to put a finger on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, gut feeling. I, I've had, I've had um, anecdotal cases of people, you know, having miraculous cures from mm. people that I are not, you know, they're, they're not full of it or themselves or things like that. And they're, you know, they're properly credentialed, they have this or that, or they have this clinical experience or that. Um, so I, it's hard to dismiss. And the, the, the idea, of, I, I, I try to come at this as neutrally as possible, because to dismiss it would imply that I actually know what I'm talking about. And yeah. among the things I'm quite convinced of is that I don't. Um, <laughs> and nor do I know anybody who knows what they're talking about. And yeah. so I can, I think I, I can relax. And just kind of go through the through the world, um, having some fun with no anticipation yeah. that I'm going to be right. Yeah. And there's nothing, think... nothing, nothing that's more freeing than that. I I start with the assumption that all beliefs are wrong. Even the beliefs that all beliefs are wrong is wrong. <laughs> I think it's not just. Um... I think it's not just that, that, that I don't think it just gives you this, you know, what, I've lost my words. I've lost my train of thought. I don't think it's just giving you um, more fun. I think it also adds to the credibility of everything. You know, the fact that you're totally open about that, that we don't know how it works. I, I'm wrong all the time. This yeah. stuff doesn't make sense. It, yeah. it, it almost can't be real, except asterisk it is yeah it happens yeah. um and i've shown it happening yeah I, th I think that's brilliant um one other aspect of of healing or i kind of kind of put them together there's, there's two others i was thinking of is one is you know with mediumship sometimes the mediums seem to have a doctor that they have coming through them or what have you and again it seems crazy but in some circumstances that has been shown to to yeah. work on a specific issue and then on the other side of that you got faith healing, you know, which is something that's been around for ages. Christians, I'm imagining throughout many religions, yeah. um, believe they have some kind of healing methods, whether it's just divine through God. They don't know what they're doing. They just put hands on somebody. Oh, God's working through me. He's working in mysterious ways. Maybe they don't have to put hands. Maybe it's just, you know, putting a prayer up. Again, I know there's some evidence to say maybe prayer could, could, be, could be something that works, um, not one religion specific but anyway again do you have any thoughts on that on that whole phenomenon of faith there are there are some good seriously controlled studies on um mediumship mm, yeah uh, and, and and so if you go to winbridge yeah yeah so julie by shell and and yeah you, you know these guys and you know mark Mark Bacuzzi, yeah. 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 I mean, Julie's, Julie has, uh, I remember reading a paper, it was a quintuple blind study. You know, um, you know, she goes after it and, and you got, yeah. you got to like that because she's, you know, if it, if it she's going to follow the data and she's yeah, going to try to do it. So she, I, I think they do a good job. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know anything in terms of, I've never done any systematic stuff on readings. I've had a couple of mediums read for me I, I haven't been impressed uh but that i i don't i, I don't have anything like a good experience that would cross any any borders yeah interesting um and your thoughts on psi phenomena and survival of consciousness or consciousness and survival of consciousness this whole kind of this these three massive topics here are yeah. <laughs> separate but also together i suppose from our conversation that you do think the evidence is there to 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 
basically prove psi phenomena is real. Um, so what do you think? Psi phenomena is real is um, it, it doesn't have enough specificity in it for my taste. Mm. Okay, you know, so you, 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 you go back to you know the founding of the British Society for Psychical Research, which I think was 1882, and then 1883, uh, the American Society for Psychical Research, you know, they did the mediumship and the table tapping and the this and the that. And then, of course, J.B. Ryan brought it into the lab. And did it, at this point, psi phenomena being real, it, it to me, it sounds as crazy as healing is real. Mm. You know, yeah, okay. uh, remote viewing is real. Remote viewing yeah. is real. You know, something happens. It doesn't mean every every remote view is accurate. It doesn't mean anything, it doesn't tell you how to do it. But yeah, you know, I mean, I I, I know of real serious applications of remote viewers. For example, a, a biologist buddy of mine uh, was trying to unravel the chemical structure that, of, of something. Could couldn't get, couldn't get to it, and so he took it to a remote viewer. And said, "Draw this thing. What does it look like?" Mm. And he drew it, and he goes, "Oh, now I know what it is." <laughs> <laughs> so all he had to do was remote view and a molecule. Wow, yeah, that's crazy. And then it was uh, observed to exist in a lab, and you know could be confirmed. But you got to, you got to, yeah. So to say, remote viewing is real. It doesn't have enough content because it doesn't say. I come in and I say, "I'm a remote viewer." I have no idea whether that's real. I don't know if I'm delusional. I don't know, you know, and it, so yeah. to, to pop it into combinations of the delusional and the tested and the untested and their criteria, you know, psi is real. Of course, psi has happened. You know, it's crazy yeah. to, to know. Can, can consciousness affect a random number generator? Yes. You know, I mean, that that's not a belief statement. You know, you got 30 years for crying out loud at the pair lab. Yeah. Uh, so to ask the question means I don't know what the data might be. Yeah, no, I get you. Um, what about in terms of survival um, after after our, our bodily death? You know, uh, life after death, the afterlife, whatever we want to phrase it. Awfully compelling. What are your thoughts. Awfully compelling. A lot of us will do a field test to see if we're right. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. Um, I, I don't. The the. The individual anecdotes are seriously interesting. I don't think there's any methodological way to separate that from what might be called sometimes super psi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting. So I think you're left with someplace in there, which one am I going to take as the least offensive <laughs> as mm -hmm. the explanation? But yeah. in, in terms of holding it together, I, taking all the anecdotes from all the different places of all the stuff that um is is it doesn't tell a coherent story yeah yeah it's very confusing and, <laughs> and really, I mean, it really is it's confusing yeah no it is and but i would say i think there are some some elements of the body of evidence for survival that don't really match up with the super psi i think i mean again you could probably make a case for it if it's really truly unlimited lim unlimited you yeah. know fully but things like birthmarks in reincarnation cases um is one thing particularly that i find very compelling and hard to hard to match up with super psi although i'm sure you could probably find a way to say oh yeah this is how yeah. But yeah. yeah, I mean, it really goes down to exactly what you said. I think you know, which where where are you drawing, and which is more compelling explanation? And mm -hmm. Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, I, I think it might be survival. On Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, I think it might be super side. And on Sunday, I don't think about it. So. Yeah, <laughs> but what I think as well, every day of the week, I think that if if it was super, if if you know if psi was again we we both agree that the evidence says it's real so if i'm saying if but i don't know why i'm saying if but i'm saying if if we say psi was proven beyond any doubt that would then give me more faith that survival could be real just likewise if survival was proved beyond any doubt that would give me more faith that psi could be real because do you see what i mean and they're both kind of they're well, affecting... I, I think either one is if you look at any uh, anomalous phenomena what you're looking at is stuff that doesn't make sense and if you can come away from that understanding that you don't really understand how the world works, then it's a positive. Mm, 
Yeah. You know, I mean, seriously, because then you, yeah. you've destroyed a believer um, and you have someone who's now more uh, looking at evidence and suggestibility and then, then, which I think is a much more important position to, to, to have. Most definitely. Most definitely. I, I, I was at a conference once with, um, I don't remember which one, uh, but I was at a conference once and one of the guest speakers, the invited speakers was a well-known theoretical physicist from an Ivy League school in New York. And he was giving a, a, a shtick on string theory and this, that, and the other thing. He's a very good speaker and he, he can take complex ideas and make them understandable and all that stuff. And he, so he, he seemed to be, you know, like a reasonable guy, open-minded, and he's talking about this, and he's not sure whether string theory is going to work, and, you know, he's not a dogmatist. Um, and and uh, somebody got up to the microphone uh, on the question and answer. Somebody got up to the microphone and said, what would it mean if consciousness could affect a random number generator? And he, he, he stopped. I was really impressed, frankly. He stopped and he said, and he just he said, let me think about that. In a long time, long pause, in an auditorium, long pause. And then he said declaratively, if consciousness can affect a random number generator, everything I know is wrong. Yeah. That's a heck of a statement. Yeah. So I, I got to the mic as fast as I could because I wanted to say, with respect, you might take a gander at 30 years of data coming out of Princeton Engineering. He didn't yeah. know about it. Now, Princeton's not that far from where we are. Um, he didn't know about it. So the information's there, but it's not getting out. Yeah. And, and, Somehow. and but to, that he would say, everything I know is, now, is, is there a more liberating statement that everything is wrong? You know, it's beautiful. Yeah. And then yeah, if wilder. everything is wrong, this goes to your, I feel comfort in, well, everything's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. You got to go back to basics, start following the evidence. But like you said, this stuff just doesn't seem to really get out. And that's, yeah. that's what we need to, we need to keep pushing it. We need to keep talking to people about it and keep making people aware of it. And, yeah. and it's going to continue trickling until the dam breaks. I think, um, yeah, might be. in the right direction. Might that's, be. that's what I want to do. I want to keep, making more people aware of it would you um just again in your opinion do you kind of think of your healing as or, or healing in general do you think of it as fitting under psi or do you think of it as something separate i think it's something separate okay it, it's it's not pk in the sense that healing doesn't go the way i want it to go doesn't follow the steps as opposed to can i make the dice come up six you know, well, now you're saying uh, my through my beneficence, I will change something that otherwise wouldn't have happened. Uh, healing, I think, is what's supposed to happen. But the he healing doesn't come from the healer. Healing comes from the healee. You've got to be ready to be healed. You need an, an, a need. Yeah. The stimulus for healing is the healee. Got you. Yeah, the need that makes sense let me ask you about something just before i kind of wrap this up something kind of unrelated um but maybe maybe you'll find some links there who knows um just your thoughts again i know it's not your area of, of specialty by any means but just your it, it's something that i delve into in this with this podcast you know i delve into kind of life after death topics surrounding that psi topics now healing um, try and keep it, you know, as serious as we can and, and skeptical, scientific, whatever way you want to look at it, but open-minded, always open-minded, always curious. What are your thoughts on UFOs, UAP, that phenomenon? Do you have any thoughts on it? I mean, again, you have observations that people have had all over the place for all over the time, you know, so it's not like it's a hidden thing. Uh, yeah. I, I, I don't pretend to know what they are. Um, I, I've seen lights in the sky, you know, dancing together and then, you know, zipping over my head and then doing this and then yeah. stopping. And then, and it's just like, that's cool. You know, uh, I, I don't, I don't get all worked up over it. Yeah. I, when I, you saw it. Oh, sure. What did, what did you think? Did you think like that's, that's, that's very cool. Some crazy, some crazy mm -hmm. high tech plane mm -hmm. or 
I mean, the, the, the SSE, the Society for Scientific Exploration, um, the founding president. Peter Sturrock, is it? Peter Sturrock, yeah. Yeah. Um, the founding president was, when he was a grad student in, in Cambridge, he was out in the field studying physics, you know, doing that stuff, and, and a UFO landed. Yeah. Uh, a, a UFO landed. And he realized what just happened. Mm. And he realized also he couldn't tell anyone. So the prohibition is against, again, you're starting with the conclusion. Well, you have to conclude that there's intelligent life all over the place. You can't conclude that they can get here because obviously it would have to be a different route than we would take. But, you know, the place has to be teeming with civilizations and a lot. So I, yeah. I don't, Peter, Peter asked, uh, we had a couple of government people from the uh, states in the Department of Defense, and they were doing a report on what they could, you know, unclassified UFOs and this and all that. And Peter had this beautiful question. He just goes, how much of the military, how much of the uh, technology that the military is using in different methods of propulsion and such, is, it really comes from your back engineering UFO observations? What a question. Yeah. And the government, they, they sort of shuffle their feet and they look down and said, well, nothing officially. Which was the answer. Yeah. Nothing officially. Nothing officially. <laughs> it doesn't, if you do psi, you're doing something that is paranormal because it doesn't make any sense. Based on our understanding of the way the world works, it's paranormal. If you do healing and you're fixing cancerous mice, you're doing something paranormal. If you're stu studying or looking at UFOs, that's not paranormal. That's just confusing. But it doesn't yeah. violate anything. No. You know, there's something wrong. It'd be like saying, um, I want to go study Bigfoot. Well, Bigfoot's not paranormal. It's just some guy with a big feet, you know, and, 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 uh, but it's not paranormal. There's nothing in the way we understand the world to work that would negate it. Yeah. My stuff doesn't make any sense. Yeah. It just doesn't, you know, so no. let's call it what it is. Um, <laughs> consciousness affecting a random number generator doesn't make any sense. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Yeah. Just means it doesn't make any sense. Paranormal is about what doesn't make sense. Yeah, absolutely. And I like to think of it as just normal that we don't understand yet yeah. rather than paranormal. Yeah. Um, same as supernatural just being natural um but thank you for sharing thoughts on on that that was that was fascinating and and i i, I just feel compelled to just ask you one last thing as well have you had any other aside from the healing and aside from the lights that you just mentioned you saw have you had any other kind of anomalous let's say experiences or experiences that won't fit into a box that society has for us the the, the, the number of people and this is from national surveys the number of people who've had psi experiences is overwhelming. Yeah. And so I've had psi experiences, but I wouldn't say they're more overwhelming than the stuff I, you know, just routine stuff that people have this. So I've, I've experienced stuff. Uh, my draw is towards control conditions. Um, but I think it's so widespread, you know, it's all over the place including people who have the sense of dead people. Yeah. Now, when my, when my, uh, the crazy guy who fixed my back, when he died, my bedroom was lit up with a ball of light in the middle. Really? At the time he died. Wow. Like the minute he died. Yeah. And it wasn't so. Wow. And I didn't like this guy because he was an idiot. Interesting, but an idiot. And we had gone our separate ways over how to deal with this and whether we should do lab stuff and all that kind of thing. So he and I were not on good terms. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, he's 
I'm not my favorite person. Talented, but not my favorite person. This this light that came into the room was pure love. Wow. And there was no question it was him. I even called. Yeah. I sat up and I and I called his name out because I and I actually reached out to him. Did it change when you did that? No. How long did it last? Time didn't mean much. I have no idea. It could have been yeah. a minute, could have been a second. You know, I, I have no idea. Yeah. But that happened. But when you answer your question, I don't know that it happens to me differently or that it happens to anybody else. You know, I, I'm not going around, you know, with a guru hat on or I, I don't swoop. No, no, absolutely not. It's just a case of, I, I love to ask, you know, everybody yeah. if they've had these kind of experiences. Because like you say, it happens to everybody. Yeah. And the more we talk about it and the more we share these experiences, the more people will feel liberated to, to you know, share their own and talk about their own. And I think that's how these, these subjects are going to gradually creep out of the darkness and into the yeah. light. Yeah. But yeah, that's that's incredible. Thank you for sharing that. That one amazing experience that must have been. Um, the last thing I'm going to ask you, Bill, is if you've got any last words, a message, any words of wisdom for anybody that's watched or listened today. It can be literally anything. Oh, I mean, on a personal level, I hope this stuff, I hope my stuff shakes your world a little bit. Mm. You know, and and that if you if you read my stuff, and I got a bunch of papers on reserve or I got a bunch of papers on the website, go read them, you know, geek out. And I, I hope you'll leave more confused than you got there. Because <laughs> you don't understand how the world works any more than I do. Yeah, I love it. Um, and send me all those links if you can, and I'll put anything that you recommend people read and, and check out. I'll put it in the description so they can sure. click on it nice and easily. Um, yeah, that's brilliant. I appreciate you so much. I, I love this build. This was fascinating. This really yeah, kind of broke my brain a little bit as you said um as i knew it would but there you go we don't understand and and we'll just keep trying and we'll keep trying to figure it out but wow this was a uh, yeah this was incredible appreciate it a lot you got it thanks for thanks for the the, the dialogue it's fun my pleasure thanks to bill bankston for talking to me and thank you for listening i hope you enjoyed the interview and are as intrigued as i am by bill's work Please see relevant links and more in the description below. Please subscribe if you want to continue unraveling the universe with us. And if you want to support us, please consider contributing via Patreon. Thank you.